Party! Welcome to Identifying Luck for Mario Party 2. It is here where we will learn how to best improve our odds of winning at the only Mario Party game that has the characters dress up according to the theme of the board. If only that charming aesthetic returned. Let's dive into the pipe and take care of the bonus stars. We've got the coin star, happening star, and minigame star. This third one awards the player that collected the most amount of coins from standard minigames only, nothing else. You can turn bonus stars off if you wish, but if you do, then you'll be turning off hidden blocks as well. You're also gonna make them cry. Don't make them cry. Our spaces for this title are Blue, Red, Happening, Bowser, Chance, Battle, Item, and Bank. During the final five turns, blue spaces and red spaces will always have their coin values doubled from three to six. A hidden block can appear after landing on a blue space. In this title, there will always be two hidden blocks on the board at a time. One contains a star and one contains 20 coins. If you get lucky and land on a blue space with a hidden block, then you'll receive your reward and that type of hidden block will move to a different blue space. Only one hidden block can be on a blue space at a time, and if you exit the board, then the hidden block's placements will shuffle upon re-entering. If the game's gone on without any hidden blocks found, then target blue spaces that haven't been landed upon yet. This kind of move should be low on your priorities, but hey, landing on the right blue space could mean the difference between a win and a loss. Bowser spaces trigger the Bowser Roulette. Its selection gets pre-randomized the moment it starts rolling, so your decision of when to stop the roulette is nothing more than a trick to make you think you had any choice to begin with. Coins for Bowser. This is the most common event, always appearing twice on the roulette wheel. The amount of coins taken varies depending on what turn the game is on and the placing of the player that landed on his space. For example, if you land on a Bowser space while you're in third place and the game is on a turn in between the first five and the last five, what we refer to as mid-game, then you will see 15 coins for Bowser appear twice on the roulette table. If you land on the Bowser space with no coins, Bowser will give you 10 coins regardless of what turn the game is on or what place you're in. Bowser's Coin Potluck. Like coins for Bowser, except he takes coins for from everyone. The amount of coins taken varies depending on what turn the game is on. Bowser Revolution. Bowser takes everyone's coins and splits them evenly among all the players. This is still a great outcome to get if you're lagging behind in coins. Its chances of appearing are slightly less in this title though. Bowser's Chance Time. This is Bowser's modified version of Chance Time. We'll get to this after Chance Time. Bowser's Multiplying Toads. Bowser does a magic trick and makes two toads appear on the board. In effect, this moves the star space's position, adding a second star space as well. However, one of the toads is Baby Bowser in disguise. Anyone who pays him 20 coins for a star makes him reveal himself and give them a worthless star. This event will reset all inactive star spaces and begin anew starting from where the real toad is. To find him, you've either got to get lucky or use one of two items. The first is a magic lamp, which will always bring you to the real toad. The second is a Bowser bomb, which will activate its corresponding event and reveal Baby Bowser in the process. Bowser's Appearing Act Bowser leaves, then appears at Baby Bowser's position as the board villain at the end of the turn. He'll roll three dice blocks, making way around the board from his current location. If Bowser meets a player, he steals all of their coins. After his turn is over, he'll disappear. 100 star present, 10,000 coin present, star steal, and stars packed to go. These are all in yellow text. If any of them are selected, then Bowser won't cough anything up and will instead flee the scene. Landing on a Bowser space when you have no coins is a fine move since you have nothing to lose. So what if Bowser's coin potluck is landed on? You don't have any coins. Coins, let him take everyone else's. Revolution, let's even the game up. Coins for Bowser, more like 10 coins for you. Bowser's chance time, as if that's anything to be afraid of. Not even Bowser's appearing act, the end all of player's coins will affect you. The only option that can possibly turn out bad for you is Bowser's multiplying toads, since it may move the star further away from you. This situation's rare though, so go for a Bowser space if your wallet's empty. Unless you're feeling in the mood for... This title's version of Chance Time functions similarly to the first Mario Parties. The player still has to hit three blocks to decide what will happen. Two of the blocks have pictures of all four players' heads, and the one in the middle shows what they're swapping, coins or stars. The player can hit the blocks in any order, but no matter what order they choose, the remaining blocks will spin faster with each hit. The side blocks, which show the player's heads, still follow the turn order. Once a player has been selected, they'll disappear off the other dice blocks so they don't end up trading with themselves. The middle dice block, which determines what will be traded between the two players, will roll one of these three cycles that it selects based on the turn number. For example, if it's the final 5 turns, then this cycle will always be the one that's selected. The dice
dice block will start at the same spot for each respective cycle, which makes it possible to time your trades. So let's say I wanted to know how many seconds I'd need to wait before jumping to get the swap stars trade for the first cycle. All I have to do is start counting from the moment the block starts spinning to the moment I see that trade. 0 and 1 and 2 and 3 and 4 and 5 and... There, now I know how to get the swap stars trade every time. I just have to jump at around 5.5 seconds or wait until 18 trades spin by. This trade is convenient to learn since it appears at the same time on both the first and the second cycle. That isn't the case for all of them. Memorize the timings of the trades you really want for each cycle and you'll become a chance time beast. When it comes time to do the deed, you first need to identify which cycle the trade block is on. You'll know which one it is based on the turn number. Remember the timing for the trade you want and jump appropriately. The side dice blocks will then spin faster, but you shouldn't select a side just yet, as most trades distinguish between left and right, and you're more likely to land on who you want for the second dice block than the third. So think about who you want on each side, then determine which side is more important to get correct. Make that the side you hit for your second dice block. This way, you'll save the least important side for the most difficult to land dice block. If the trade you selected at the beginning was the swap coins, swap stars, or swap coins and stars one, then go on either side and land on the player with the most amount of what's going to be traded so you can at least ensure their demise. Bowser's chance time. Like chance time, but Bowser rigs it so that he is on the receiving end of the trade. Unlike normal chance time, stars cannot be lost. If the player who gives coins to Bowser does not have any, Bowser will give them 10 coins. The middle dice block, which determines what will be given to Bowser, will roll one of these three cycles that it selects based on the turn number. It's not like you can put this knowledge into practice though, since both dice blocks are spinning at their fastest possible speed. It's not too bad, since you only have a 1 in 4 chance of being selected to lose something. What also makes it better is that you wouldn't be giving your coins away to another player in the game, just Bowser. So while Bowser's chance time may sound scary, just know that the odds are in your favor, and even if it doesn't work out, it's still not nearly as bad as it could be. If a player lands on the battle space, Goomba comes by, gets a certain amount of coins from each player, and a battle mini game begins. The amount of coins he'll take from each player is determined via roulette. The possible results are 10, 20, 30, and 50. The chances each amount have of showing up is dependent upon the turn number. During the first five turns, the low amounts are dominant, and it's rare to see a number as high as 50 get selected. During the mid-game, the low amounts are still common, but they give some more room for the higher amounts to get chosen. During the final five turns, the low amounts and high amounts seem to balance out a bit, so don't be surprised if that jackpot gets huge. Speaking of which, players attempt to battle each other to get the jackpot that the Goomba took. First place gets 70% of the coins, and second place gets 30% of the coins. This won't always be the payout percentage. Sometimes players will tie for first or second, which will change the distribution. If the total jackpot is not a multiple of 10, all coins but one will be distributed in the proper manner, and the remaining coin goes to a random player. If a player lands on the item space, they will play an item minigame for a chance to get an item. The minigame varies depending on the board being played. If a player passes the bank space, they must pay 5 coins to the Koopa Bank. If a player has less than 5 coins, the bank will take it all anyway. If a player lands in this space, the player gains all the coins from the bank deposit. The bank can hold up to 999 coins. You can tell how many coins are in the bank by counting up the amount of coins next to it. 1 means at least 5 coins, 2 means at least 15 coins, 3 means at least 25 coins, 4 means at least 35 coins, and 5 means at least 45 coins. The coins stop piling up at this amount, so at that point you need to keep track yourself. This space has more potential to change the game the more coins it collects from players. Not many banks are close to junctions in this title, but if you happen to be next to one and you have the option to land on it, then there's little reason to not do so. If losing 5 coins would be a huge detriment to your game, then try to avoid the bank space as best you can. Sometimes you'll run into it no matter what you do though, so play as if you losing 5 coins in the near future is guaranteed. There's a bank space near the beginning of almost every board, which tends to be good for the player that rolls last since they'll get a lot of coins if they happen to land on the bank space after the first 3 players pass it. This title has 10 items for players to get their hands on. Mushroom, Skeleton Key, Plunder Chest, Dueling Glove, Warp Block, Golden Mushroom, Magic Lamp, Boo Bell, Bowser Suit, and Bowser Bomb. 
These first seven items can be obtained by either buying them from the item shop or winning them from an item minigame. These last three items can be obtained through an item minigame or chance event in Bowser Land, which we'll cover later. A player can only hold one item at a time in this title. Did you know that the item shop isn't random at all? All what they have in stock when you visit is actually dependent upon what turn the game is on and your current placing. For example, if it's the final five turns and you're in third place, then the item shop will have a mushroom, a skeleton key, a warp block, a golden mushroom, and a magic lamp. With this knowledge, you'll know exactly when the item you want is available at the item shop. Heck, you could purposely lower your placing to make an item appear in the shop if you're that desperate to get it. While this kind of move is incredibly situational, it's still an option. Every CPU has an item they're more likely to either purchase when they're at a shop or target when it shows up in an item minigame. Mario prefers mushrooms, Luigi prefers skeleton keys, Peach prefers plunder chests, Wario prefers dueling gloves, Yoshi prefers warp blocks, and DK prefers Bowser bombs. I'll go over some strategies you can execute with some of these items once we're on the boards, but for now, let's arm ourselves with general info. Mushroom. When used, this item allows the player to roll two dice blocks instead of one. The digits of both rolls are added up together and the player will move that many spaces. If the player rolls a seven on both dice blocks, then they'll get 20 coins. If they roll any other number on both dice blocks, then they'll get 10 coins. If you're trying to get somewhere quick and cheap, then the mushroom's here for you. Skeleton Key. This item is activated automatically whenever a player who possesses it is about to run into a locked gate. They'll be given the option to open the gate, and if they do, then the key will be used up. Funny enough, you don't even have to go through a gate you just unlocked. You could just use the skeleton key and leave. This may sound like a weird move, but keep in mind that the skeleton key has a lot of potential for overstaying its welcome in your inventory. You can use every other item whenever you want, except the Bowser Bomb, but that's beside the point. The skeleton key can only be used at a gate and can't be discarded in this title, so if you ever shoot for it, then make sure you put yourself in a position to actually use it. Otherwise, you'll put yourself at a disadvantage. Plunder Chest. When this item is used, the player using it will steal the item from a randomly chosen opponent. Considering players can only hold one item at a time in this title, the Plunder Chest is busted. Imagine you're at the item shop, see a golden mushroom, and think to yourself, All right, let's do this. Just for you to remember, oh, one of my opponents has a Plunder Chest and will steal from me if I get this great item. Cool. Even worse, imagine you're playing an item minigame and see a magic lamp and go, all right, let's go, easy star, just for you to remember, oh, one of my opponents has a plunder chest and will steal from me if I get this great item. Cool. Yeah, the plunder chest is dumb. Granted, your chances of being stolen from are only 100% if there's no one else to steal from, so you can feel a little bit safe if there's another player or two with an item. The plunder chest commands respect. If someone has it, try to bait them into stealing something you don't want as much or just hope that they steal from someone else instead. Dueling Glove. When used, the player using it will summon a Goomba. The player will then choose an opponent to duel in a duel minigame. After this, the player will have the option to choose how much is to be dueled for. In this title, you can only duel for coins. The highest amount of coins the player can choose can't go over the least wealthy player's total amount, obviously. You should get this item from an item minigame rather than from the item shop. Imagine spending 15 coins to bet coins against someone in a minigame you're not guaranteed to win. Unless you're me, of course. You're better off shooting for a boo bell, but that won't always be possible, so if you're desperate to take away coins from a threat, then be my guest. Just keep in mind which board you're on, since that decides which dual minigame you'll play. We'll get more into that later. Golden Mushroom. When used, the player using it will roll three dice blocks instead of one. The digits of all three rolls are added together, and the player will move that many spaces. If the player rolls a 7 in all three dice blocks, then they'll get 50 coins. If they roll any other number on all three dice blocks, then they'll get 20 coins. If you're trying to get somewhere really quick and kind of expensive, then the golden mushroom's here for you. Warp Block. When used, the warp block will appear above the player using it. The player will then hit the block. The effect of this is that the player will switch places with a randomly chosen opponent. The player can then roll a dice block to move normally after having warped. You can't control which player you warp to, which does suck, but there's still some strategy to be had here. Let's say every other player on the board has a better position than you. Then the warp block is going to be useful no matter who you swap with. If you're willing to bet a 1 in 3 odds of switching with the player you want, then make sure the other two players' positions wouldn't screw you over entirely if you end up 
up switching with them instead. If you switch with a player that's on a bank space, then the bank will count that as you having landed on its space, which is weird since you can always roll after using a warp block, making this a strange scenario where you can actually land on two spaces in one turn. If you switch with a player that's on a star space, then you'll be allowed the opportunity to purchase a star. There may be other wacky warp block shenanigans I'm unaware of, but that's all for now. Magic Lamp When used, the player summons the Mushroom Genie. He gives the player a ride on his back and takes the player directly to the star space. The player is then asked whether they wish to trade 20 coins for a star or not. This item's cost of 30 coins is rough. You normally don't want to shell out that much for a single item, but cutting another player off from a star may be that vital to you winning the game at times. Check where everyone is relative to the star's position, keep their placings in mind, and decide from there if the cost is worth it. The magic lamp only brings you to the star and nothing else. This means you can use it to teleport to the star, not purchase one, and go on your way. That might sound ridiculous, but there are plenty of situations where this may be be the best move. For example, your opponent just purchased a plunder chest and you're the only target. May as well use up your magic lamp instead of letting them have it. As said before, the magic lamp won't get tricked by Bowser's multiplying toads. It'll lead you directly to the real star. Boo Bell. When used, the player using it will summon Boo. Boo lets players steal coins or stars from other players. It costs 5 coins to steal coins. The minimum and maximum amount of coins Boo can steal varies depending on the turn number. For example, on the first 5 turns, the lowest amount of coins he can steal is around 9, whereas the highest amount of coins he can steal is around 15. What determines the exact number of coins he steals depends on how quickly the victim mashes when prompted. The faster they mash, the less he steals. While stealing coins during the mid-game in the final 5 turns will net you a profit, it's a quick way of getting players to target you. Check if anyone else has a Boo Bell or is close to Boo on the board and make your best judgment. It costs 50 coins to steal stars and you still have no way to defend yourself if you're the victim. Your only real option is to convince the player making the selection to steal from someone else. This can be done by slyly mentioning that you don't have a certain bonus star, whereas a different player does making them a much better target to steal from than little ol' you. Regardless of what you say, don't be too forceful. Make it subtle. Bowser Suit When used, the player using it will masquerade themselves as Bowser. The masqueraded player will then roll the dice block, and any players whom are passed will have to give 20 coins to the masqueraded player. If the player passes Baby Bowser during their turn, he will give them all the coins he has collected from players throughout the game. When used at the right time, the Bowser suit can be a deadly item. Try using it at the most opportune time, such as when multiple players are ahead of you, Baby Bowser's ahead of you, or both. With the right execution, this item could pull your coin count far ahead of your opponents. Characters other than Baby Bowser sometimes have reactions to the Bowser suit, but it doesn't affect their gameplay functions, except for three characters in Bowser Land who will give the player in the Bowser suit an easy time because of the mistaken identity. Bowser Bomb When used, Baby Bowser will transform into Bowser. Bowser will then roll three dice blocks and will move accordingly. Any player that Bowser passes will lose all of their coins. This is an incredibly scary item for a player to get hold of, especially if you're rocking a lot of coins. To avoid all of them going down the drain, get as far away from the baby Bowser space as possible as soon as you see the player get this item. If you've already taken your turn or you're the player that got this item, then just hope Bowser rolls low. You normally don't want to win this in an item minigame, but if your opponents are far ahead in coins, then sometimes it's best to just take them down with you. Remember that this item reveals the fake toad in the Bowser's Multiplying Toads event. Once 5 turns remain, the final 5 turns event will commence. The event is hosted by Toad, or Baby Bowser if you're playing in Bowserland. He'll give the current standings, then introduce a character to predict the superstar. Usually a green or red-shelled Koopa Troopa predicts it, but sometimes Womp makes the prediction, who will always choose Mario, even if he isn't competing. However, it is always Bowser who makes the prediction in Bowserland. He'll always choose the player who is currently in last place. The predicted player is given 10 coins from 
from the predictor. From that point onward, blue and red spaces coin values are doubled, and players that land on the same space as another play a dual minigame with that player before activating the space. If a player lands on the space with more than one player, then they must choose who they wish to duel. Dueling another player for coins is a fine move so long as you're confident in playing the dual minigame for the board you're on. If you are, then bet it all! I'm joking, unless you really want to meme that hard. This title's an amusement park, and they want you to know it since every board's name has land at the end of it. Another thing they have in common is these difficulty ratings, yet again. I'll admit they're a bit more accurate this time around, but I still encourage you to ignore them for the most part. Yar, it's time to find some booty in pirate land. Here's the space <clears throat> Oh god, this is gonna be terrible. Arr, it's time to find some booty in pirate land. Here's the space lineup, Latty. Out of all the boards, it ties for the least amount of blue spaces at 54, and ties for the least amount of red spaces at 6. Let's remind ourselves how the star space works. On most boards when you buy a star, the star space itself will move to another random location. However, only certain spaces have been programmed to host a star. We refer to these spaces as star spaces and normally only one is active at a time. When a star space isn't active, it looks like a good old blue space. Let's say you're in the middle of a game. You remember that these five star spaces have been deactivated and you notice that the current active star space is this one. So I ask you, where will the next star spawn. Right here, since all the other ones are either deactivated or will deactivate after its star has been purchased. Pretty straightforward stuff. Baby Bowser is initially placed on one of the star spaces, just like Toad, and every time that a star is bought from Toad, he will move to Toad's previous location. If a player passes Baby Bowser, he will steal 5 coins from that player. However, he occasionally gives a player 5 coins instead, later claiming that this was an accident. Oh, I guess Bowser's occasional kind-heartedness rubs off on his minions. There are two thwomps that block shortcuts and request a fee from players if they want to take the shortcut. The fee always starts at one coin, but goes up by at least one coin each time a player pays to pass. The fee can never lower, its limit is 999 coins, and the two thwomps do not share the same fee. This gimmick should feel familiar, as it was reused from Yoshi's Tropical Island from the first Mario Party. The main difference between the two is how the gimmick is executed. Whereas in Yoshi's Tropical Island, you needed to pay a thwomp if you wanted full access to the board, Pirate Land makes the board more open only requiring you to pay a thwomp if you wish to take a shortcut. You can pay many more coins than the previous amount to make a shortcut inaccessible to players that don't have enough to pay the fee. This is best done when you know there's a point of interest players may target, such as a star or boo. This guy is especially useful on this board since players already have their hands full with these fees. Stealing coins to prevent players from getting star or taking a shortcut is a great move, so great in fact that you might get targeted for doing so. If you end up with an empty wallet, then you'll be at a bigger disadvantage than normal in this board since you won't be able to take any shortcuts. This is why you need to be cautious when it comes to spending your coins. Don't dip too low. If you land on a blue space next to a dock, then a shark will come and take you to the next dock counterclockwise. This is indicated by the arrows on the docks themselves. That's cool and all, but why are these blue spaces not happening spaces? Kinda weird. Anyways, landing on one of these spaces is a fantastic way to travel between islands quick and easy. The right dock is next to the item shop, so if you have the option of landing on the lower dock, then consider doing so if getting an item next turn would be a good move for you. If you land on a happening space, then the ship will fire cannonballs at the corresponding bridges. This will blast everyone that was standing there back to start. If they don't have any movement items, then this action could destroy their game. If you're worried about being on the receiving end of a happening space, then make sure you have a movement item in stock, cause let's be real. Someone is going to get blown up, and it very well could be you. There's one gate on each island just waiting to be unlocked by a skeleton key. The left gate doesn't actually help out much. Yeah, you could use it to get to this star space, but you could also just pay the thwomp a few spaces down. There's even a Bowser space on the other side of this gate too. The only reason to use your skeleton key here is if paying the thwomp is too expensive or if you desperately need to cut ahead as soon as possible. Otherwise, you're better off saving it for the right gate, which will bring you much closer to Boo, and you already know how good that is. There's a high chance of you landing on an item space if you travel to the bottom of the left island cause there's three of them in a row, are you kidding me? <laughs> landing on one will make you play Pirate Land's item minigame, Roll Out the Barrels. This is one of the easiest item minigames in the game. 
game. Just keep track of the item you want and BAM, you're good. What's also good is having a mushroom or golden mushroom in your possession as you walk around this board. I said it before and I'll say it again, getting blown off a bridge sucks. If you don't land on the blue space by the dock, then you'll be spending multiple turns trying to travel back to where you were. But with a mushroom, anything is possible. Unless you roll low, then only tears are possible. The magic lamp's value on this board will vary depending on how expensive the shortcut fees have gotten. If you only have to pay around 10 coins for the shortcuts, then 30 coins for a magic lamp may not be worth it. On the other hand, if that star's far and those fees are a disease, then genie away. Pirate Land's dual minigame is Saber Swipes, where you simply need to execute all the buttons on your side of the screen before your opponent does. Overall, Pirate Land has this weird mixture of strategy and randomness. You may find yourself in deep thinking mode considering every player's position and placing before paying a thwomp the exact amount of coins to screw them over just for one of them to land on a happening space and send you back to start. So long as you're prepared for something like that happening, I'm sure you'll be fine. Howdy partner, welcome to Western Land. Here's the space lineup y'all. Out of all the boards, this one's got the most blue spaces at 72, the most red spaces at 10, the most battle spaces at 8, and ties for the most item spaces at 8. In fact, this board has the most spaces out of every Mario Party board in existence. I think, here are, here are 7 star spaces. For a board this huge, you bet there's a way for players to get around easier. Take a gander at Steamer, who travels around the board and stops at one of the three train stations. If a player wants to ride Steamer, he or she has to pay the toll of five coins. Once on, the player hits a block that decides which direction Steamer goes. If it shows Toad's head, the train moves forward and stops at the nearest station. If it shows a Goomba, the train moves backward and stops at the nearest station. Sadly, there isn't a way to get what you want. Landing on a happening space will make Steamer move forward to the next station. While Steamer is moving in either direction, players that are in the way are knocked back to start. That last detail is crucial. Imagine one of your opponents being really close to something they want just for you to knock them back to start. This kind of punishment was bad in Pirate Land, but in a board as big as this, it can be torture. Always keep track of where your opponents are on the track. It'd be a shame if you didn't take advantage of their positions, whether it be through boarding the train or landing on a happening space. There's a wiggler that owns a milk shop on the top left part of the board. It asks players that come by if they want to start a nanny for 20 coins. If the player accepts, the fee is paid and all of the other players come to the milk shop area. While paying 20 coins may suck, this event definitely has its advantages. You move your remaining spaces after the event's over, which will put you ahead of everyone else. If a threatening player was close to the star, then getting them out of there is a good move. Unless you killed your wallet in the process, then it probably wasn't a good idea. The drawback to this event is that it places everyone fairly close to Boo, so keep in mind your opponent's coin totals before deciding to host a nanny. Speaking of Boo, there's two of them here. Man, who could forget that? How unique! It's like there's no other board in the whole franchise that has two boos on them. Wow! <laughs> Using a mushroom or golden mushroom to quickly travel along the outer part of the board can make you some serious coinage if you stop by both boos. Try not to land on any spaces on the track if you don't want to get sent back to the starting space. This whole time I've been making it sound like getting sent to the starting space is always a bad thing, which is far from the case. It can be great sometimes. Imagine if the star is all the way down here while you're all the way up here. Sucks, right? Well, if you get hit back to the starting space, then you'll be a lot closer to your goal. It's also not too far away from the item shop. Which brings up another topic. This board's item minigame. Give me a break. This one requires timing. Just press the A button when the item you want is two spots before the arrow. There are two gates on the board, one on the left and one on the right. The left gate functions as a shortcut, and it's a fair one at that. Don't be afraid to use your skeleton key here if it means getting ahead. Just be careful of the Bowser space. Funny enough, there are two Bowser spaces on this path which the right gate can help you avoid. There's also a bank there just waiting to take your money. Alright, I get it, this gate's worth taking. You may be thinking, but no no no. Deciding to move towards the right gate means ignoring Boo. To do that would be throwing away a great opportunity at making a profit. The initial path towards Boo even avoids the two Bowser spaces and has a happening to boot. Okay, so this gate isn't worth taking. You may be reconsidering, and you'd be right. 
For the most part, the secret that this gate's been holding in all along is that it's blocking the path to where a star can spawn. That's right, a star can spawn right here. So unless you're grabbing that star or landing on chance time, then take the route towards Boo. This will put you on the tracks, but the risk isn't nearly as high as the reward. Yes, warp blocks can be pretty useful on this board because of its size. Glad you asked. Westerland's dual minigame is Quick Draw Quirks, where all you need to do is react to the Goomba saying, Go! Quicker than your opponent. Overall, Western Land is a joy to transverse as long as you respect how huge it is. Take advantage of movement items and the train so you don't fall behind. <laughs> Zoom's like here. Zoom's like here. Do you read? We've arrived at Spaceland. Here's the space lineup. Out of all the boards, it ties for the least amount of red spaces at 6, has the least amount of happening spaces at 5, and ties for the most amount of item spaces at 8. Here are its seven star spaces. The main part of this board is the Bowser face junction with the LED in its mouth. Every time it's passed by, it counts down one unit. It always starts at five, and when it reaches zero, Bowser will fire the Bowser beam from his satellite, which will travel from the top right corner of the map to the bottom left corner of the map. Any players that get caught in the blast lose all of their coins. That's terrible, but the chances of this happening to you are incredibly slim as long as you're paying attention to the counter in the middle. If it's on one or two, then maybe going down the diagonal path isn't a good idea especially if you have tons of coins. Sometimes taking the shortcut is worth the risk though. After all, why take the long way when you can cut across? If you're that intent on taking this route despite the counter being on a low number, then use a mushroom or golden mushroom beforehand unless you want a player close by to take full advantage of your position. On the other hand, if you see a threatening player within the line of fire while the counter is on a low number, then feel free to screw them over. A fantastic way of getting that counter down as quickly as possible is to constantly move in circles on this part of the board, be careful though, since you may end up in the line of fire yourself. To avoid the chances of this happening, have a skeleton key in possession so you can flee through this gate. But don't consider that until you hear what I have to say on this gate in a few moments. Players who land on a happening space will make a thwomp or womp in a space cruiser, chase them and any other players in the way to the other side of the board. The space cruiser's route depends on which happening space was landed on. If it was one of these happening spaces on the top, then the space cruiser will chase every player on any of these these spaces to this spot. If it was one of these happening spaces on the bottom, then the space cruiser will chase every player on any of these spaces to this spot. However, there is also a group called the Sniffa Patrol that helps out a player if they pay 5 coins. Upon doing this action, a Sniffit will set up a speed trap. If a player lands on a happening space with a Sniffit on patrol, the speeder will chase them down as usual but then the Sniffit chases them down the bottom or top side of the board, with any players in the way being chased as well. That's odd, why would you ever want to pay 5 coins so you're sent back even further if the happening space event triggers? There's a few reasons. Let's say you're down here and the star just spawned above you. Yeah, bad luck. Under normal circumstances, this would be a near hopeless situation, but if you pay 5 coins to a Sniffit and manage to land on a happening space, then you'd move yourself backwards tons of spaces. This kind of maneuver would put you much closer to the star. As always, you've got to think from the opposing perspective as well. Is there a threatening player nearing closer to the star? Pay the sniff it and see if you can land on a happening space. Cause if you do, then you and that player are in for a ride. Just make sure they don't get angry enough to use Boo on you. Yeah, his name's coming up again. I know I sing Boo's praises a lot, but it's only because of how useful he is no matter what board you're playing on. Here in Spaceland, you can visit him fairly often if you decide to take this route over and over. Doing so will not only ensure that you can steal tons of coins, but it'll also put you in a good position to grab a star should one of these star spaces activate. Not to mention that you'll be avoiding both bank spaces too. The downside of sticking to this route is that you'll be missing out on all the other star spaces and the item shop, which leads us to this board's item minigame, Hammer Slammer. This one's about precise positioning. If you want an item down low, then don't hit the target too hard. If you want an item up high, then hit the target pretty hard. Just make sure you don't hit it too hard or you'll end up with Baby Bowser. There are two gates on the board, one on the left and one on the right. The left gate provides you with the shortcut down to the main junction, so if you're looking for fast travel then this is a great op- Wait, is that Boo? Oh, if there were any doubts about using your skeleton key on this gate then they should be gone now. I give this gate an A. 
plus, because it also has a chance time space on its route as well, which can be dangerous, but hey, it's a fun. Let's see how the right gate stacks up. There's only blue spaces on its route, which isn't bad, but isn't all too impressive either. Is it a useful shortcut? It, it, it skips boo. Why does it skip boo? Yeah, yeah, this gate provides a shortcut to the right side of the board, but I can't imagine many scenarios where you'll need something like that often since there's only one star space close to its path. Heck, it even skips a star space. Unless you're in that rare situation where this star space is active and no one else is near it, you're better off using your skeleton key at the other gate. For a board that looks so chaotic, the stars seem relatively easy to get to. Mushrooms and golden mushrooms are still useful of course, but they aren't as necessary as they were on previous boards. I'm also finding it hard to recommend using the warp lock here. It's not a terrible item for this board by any means, but its usefulness isn't as prevalent because it's fairly easy to adjust where you're going if you end up getting swapped with someone. Spaceland's dual minigame is Time Bomb, where all you have to do is stop your timer closer to zero than your opponent does. Overall, Spaceland can be a pain for those not used to navigating it and a joy for those that are. Make sure you're the latter. <laughs> Is, 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 is this is this thing picking up? I sure hope so. This is Mystery Land. Here's the space lineup. Out of all the boards, it has the least amount of blue spaces at 37, the most amount of happening spaces at 18, the least amount of battle spaces at 3, and the least amount of total spaces at 81. Here are its here are seven star spaces. Why did I reuse the same joke? It is divided into four areas to which people warp to each time they land on a happening space. The area you warp to isn't random and the board wants you to know that judging from these huge arrows. Each area has a designated space players will warp to. This is made clear by the outline the space is given. For example, if you land on a happening space in the bottom right area, then you will always teleport to this space in the bottom left area. You'll be happy to hear that you are given some movement options on this board, which prevents it from acting too much like Wario's Battle Canyon from the first Mario Party. Players can pay 10 coins to have a Bob-omb UFO take them to the opposite area, but sometimes the UFO will malfunction and take the player to a small area with ruins. If you land on a happening space while in the ruins, then you'll be teleported to a random area. The chances of you ending up at the ruins are low, and even if you do, then you have a good chance of getting out pretty quickly. This is why you shouldn't be afraid to take the UFO, especially if it bring you closer to the star. You may have noticed these strange houses on the board. If you visit one, you can pay 5 coins to curse yourself or another player to reduce the number on their next dice block to 1 through 3. Always view the map and check every player's position before making a decision. If someone's close to the star, then you could totally screw them out of it. If someone's close to chance time, then you can increase their odds of landing on it by a ton. There are many possibilities to be had here, so don't ignore this mechanic. There are two gates on the board, one on the left and one on the right. They're both pretty equal in terms of usefulness because they both lead to the same junction almost immediately. This junction isn't too shabby either. It lets you move between areas on your own instead of hoping that you land on a happening space or paying coins for the UFO. The only difference between these gates, other than their positions of course, are the spaces they provide on their routes. The right gate has two spaces, whereas the left gate has one blue space and a chance time space. Depending on what kind of person you are, that chance time space could make the left gate either better or worse than the right one. For me, it makes it a lot better. I think it's safe to say that mushrooms and golden mushrooms won't help you out on this board that much. Each area loops back into itself, so a high number doesn't matter as much as having the exact number you need to land on a happening space. It's more useful to grab a skeleton key so you actually have a choice in where you're headed. Using warp blocks on this board is mean. Imagine one of your opponents having spent so much time to finally get to the area with the star, just for them to switch positions with you. That's evil, frustrating, and a good option for you to consider, but prioritize skeleton keys a bit more, okay? Boo's located in the top left area, so if you're gonna get stuck in any area, hope it's that one so you can visit him over and over. If there's any area to not get stuck in, it's the one that's hosting Baby Bowser at the time, cause if you're there in that small space when a Bowser bomb activates, then you can be pretty sure that all your coins are gone. Mystery Land's item minigame is Malico Round, where you have to time your swings to knock down the blocks below the item you want. Its dual minigame is Psychic Safari, where you need to alternate pressing A and B repeatedly faster than your opponent to win. Overall, Mystery Land is yours for the taking, as long as you don't get stuck in the same area for years. 
Prepare to enter your nightmares in Horrorland. Here's the space lineup. Out of all the boards, this one has quite the average array of spaces, but the same can't be said for its mechanics. Here are its 7 star spaces. Go for them if you dare! <laughs> the gimmick of this board is that it alternates between day and night every two turns. You can keep track of when the time of day is going to change if you check the icon on the top middle part of the screen. Sun means daytime and moon means nighttime. If you see a sun with clouds or a moon with clouds, then that means the time of day is going to change on the next turn. The time of day determines which boos are available. During the day, these two are active and these three are not. During the night, these three are active and these two are not. You may have noticed that this boo slab looks a bit bigger than the others. That's because it's home to Big Boo. This big bodacious boo boy will give you the option to steal coins or stars from all the other players for three times the normal price of the average boo. That's 15 coins to steal coins from everyone and 150 coins to steal a star from everyone. The minimum and maximum amount of coins big boo can steal varies depending on the turn number. For example, on the first 5 turns, the lowest amount of coins he can steal is around 27, whereas the highest amount of coins he can steal is around 45. This is triple the amount you'd get from a normal boo, which makes the cost well worth it, especially during the mid-game and the final 5 turns. Stealing a star from every player sounds great, but at the cost of 150 coins? Eh, it's situational. If all three players have a star, then yeah, go for it. But if only two players have a star, then that's where your judgment comes in. Remember, a normal boo can steal one star for 50 coins. So if you visit two boos back to back, then you can spend 100 coins to steal two stars altogether. That's 50 coins cheaper than what Big Boo would be offering in this scenario. The obvious difference is that you'd actually have to get to those two normal boos to make the exchange. I'd only spend 150 coins to steal two stars if the game was about to end soon, otherwise I'd travel to the many other boos on the board. Obviously, don't steal a star for 150 coins unless you're really, really desperate. There are two gates on the board, one in the top and one in the bottom. It's best to use your skeleton key on the top gate when you know you can visit Big Boo, otherwise you should hold off on using it. Same logic applies for the bottom gate and its boo. You could go the whole game without visiting Big Boo, but he's such a powerhouse in this board that you'd be a fool not to. During the day, Womps guard three separate junctions, and players who wish to take the path Womp is blocking have to pay him five coins. Players that take the path Womp is not guarding makes him move to that pathway. These Womps are similar to the ones from DK's Jungle Adventure. The difference is that at nighttime, the Womps are under a spell that makes them unable to move. This makes your decisions during the daytime all that more important. It isn't just about you getting to where you want to go, it's also about blocking your opponents from where they want to go. There are other ways of changing the time of day rather than just waiting two turns for day to turn to night and vice versa. Landing on a happening space changes the time too. At nighttime, players that come by a dancing floor are asked by a few boos and Mr. Eyes if they want to dance with them for 20 coins. Accepting this makes night become day. Hey, is that the piano from Super Mario 64? That's pretty cool, what the heck? Oh, anyways, during the daytime, players that come by the mystery mansion at the top of the board are answered at the door by Kamek the Magikoopa. He asks players that they want him to light the darkness lamp for 10 coins. If accepted, he'll light it and day becomes night. Regardless of whatever method is used to change the time of day, always consider the positions of your opponents. I cannot stress that enough. For example, if it's daytime and a threatening player is close to the top gate with a skeleton key in hand, then don't turn it to nighttime or else you'll pay for it. Inversely, if it's daytime and you're in a good position to see Big Boo, then try to make it night beforehand. These are only a couple scenarios that could happen in a game. There are way more than these, which is why I encourage you to have a good overview on the board on every turn. When players come to Mr. Eye's warp spot, he appears to them asking if they want to see his magic. If they accept, Mr. Eye takes them and any other players in the way to the warp spot on the other side of the board. The fee for this is 10 coins during the day and 5 at night. This move could be a fantastic one or a deadly one depending on the situation. Imagine if you brought a threatening player to the top of the board just for them to turn the time of day to night so they can visit Big Boo. 
that really suck. Of course, you could totally screw over opponents as well by moving them far away from their intended direction. It all depends on where the players are. You've already heard about the greatness that is the skeleton key for this board, but what about the other items? If it's nighttime and you're next to this junction, then using a mushroom or golden mushroom would help you nail both of these boos in a row before they become unavailable due to the daytime. Don't be afraid to take this route without any items though, since you still have a good chance of making a lot of profit. Horror Land's item minigame is Coffin Congestion, where all you need to do is keep track of where the item you want teleports to by the end. This board's dual minigame is Mushroom Brew, where you need to press every button that appears above your pot. You win if you get more of them right than your opponent. Overall, Horror Land has tons of stuff going on. Keep a close eye on your opponent's positions and the time of day. Doing so will give you a lot of information to make the best decisions on such an event-filled board. Let's finish off the boards with Bowserland. Here's the space lineup. Out of all the boards, it ties for the least amount of blue spaces at 54, has the least amount of item spaces at 5, and has the most amount of bank spaces at 3. Here are its 7 star spaces. The main attraction in Bowserland is the Bowser Parade that occurs every 5 turns. Anyone caught in the parade's path is pushed back to the start, dropping 2 coins per space along the way. Players who pass by the parade planning offices can change the direction of the parade for 5 coins. If no one is in the parade's path, it will not occur. In addition, the parade cannot turn directly around, so if a pathway suggests that, the parade will not occur. You can lose tons of coins if you get caught up in this parade. Remember how many turns are left until the next parade starts and make sure you're out of its way. If you're feeling evil, then change the direction of the parade's path so your opponents lose as many coins as possible. If you land on a happening space near a green pipe or a red pipe, then you'll enter it and reappear from a green pipe. You can't reappear from the same pipe you entered in. There's a green pipe on each corner of the board along with this one in a hard to reach location. If you manage to pop up there, then you get a nice visit to your good pal Boo, who's always got your back unless your opponent's the one paying him. If you land on any of these three happening spaces, then you'll be forced to go on the metallic bloopers ride, where you'll be caught in a loop unless you can land on another happening space, which will spit you out right here. Ending up in this section of the board can be frustrating, but hey, at least you get a couple happening spaces out of it. The banks here work a bit different than what you're used to. Instead of Koopa banks, Bowser banks appear. The baby Bowser banker will loan out five coins to players that pass the bank space. Players that land on the bank space must pay back the loan in full. If the player does not have any coins at all, but has a star, the baby Bowser will take the star. It's definitely awesome that you can get 5 coins every time you pass the bank space, but landing on it can really hurt. I tell you to purchase a mushroom or golden mushroom to try to bypass these spaces if it weren't for the fact that the item shop functions differently too. There's a baby Bowser shopkeeper who sells an item to the players who pass by whether they want it or not even if they don't have enough coins, and even on the last turn. It can be a mushroom for 12 coins, a skeleton key for 12 coins, a bowser suit for 12 coins, a bowser bomb for 12 coins, or warp block for 17 coins. I'm not sure why the warp block is more expensive than the others. You could use it while you're stuck in the loop over here, but using it anywhere else makes for a fairly mediocre move. Kinda weird. If you wear the Bowser suit and pass by a parade planning office, then the baby Bowser will mistake you for Bowser and allow you to change the route of the parade for free. Passing the Bowser bank in the suit will grant you 20 coins. Passing the item shop in the suit will grant you either a skeleton key, a boo bell, a magic lamp, or a golden mushroom for free. Talk about a steal! If there's anywhere to use the Bowser suit, it's right here behind this item shop or behind your opponents. Altogether though, this version of the item shop is a big slap in the face for player input on how the game turns out. Normally you'd be able to strategize by purchasing certain items, but here your rights were taken away. You should still try to make the most of it though. There are two gates on the board, one in the left and one in the right. The right gate opens up the path to Boo, which is great, except that the pathway there has a Bowser space as well, so it's up to you. The left gate guards a chance time space and a battle space, which are good options, but the main reason this gate has for existing is to guard this star space. Under normal circumstances, a player would simply purchase a skeleton key to get a star that spawns here. But since this board's item shop functions the way it does, that isn't possible. You instead have to hope that you get a skeleton key if you want any chances of getting a star here. But wait, the item minigame, surely that can help out, right? 
Well, Bowser Land's item minigame is Bowser Slots, where you need to match three of an item to get it. While timing your jumps isn't that hard, it's definitely more difficult than what the other item minigames have you do. With all of this in mind, there's a high possibility that if a star spawns here, then it's gonna get pretty lonely. This board's dual minigame is Rock Paper Mario, where Mario beats Bowser, Bowser beats Peach, and Peach beats Mario. It functions just like Rock Paper Scissors. Overall, Bowser Land has a lot of wacky twists twists on the formula you're used to. Don't let them catch you off guard, and you'll be much more well off. This title has 64 minigames that all have a chance to pop up in party mode. There's 21 4-player minigames, 11 1v3 minigames, 12 2v2 minigames, 8 battle minigames, 6 duel minigames, and 6 item minigames. Out of all Mario Party titles 1-7, through seven, this one ties for the most 2v2 minigames, ties for the most battle minigames, has the least duel minigames, and ties for the most and least item minigames. A total of 21 minigames are reused from the original Mario Party, either boasting a spin on the original concept or blatantly copying all the mechanics of the original. Needless to say, some of my advice for these minigames may sound a little familiar to you. The coin collecting minigames, Deep Sea Salvage, Quicksand Cash, and Magnet Carta do not show up until the last 15 turns. These minigames have a yellow font in-game indicating that instead of the basic rewards for minigames played, 10 coins, the players get the amount of coins they collect. 4 player minigames. Abandon ship. Quickly climb to the top of the mast before the ship sinks beneath the sea. This minigame will choose one of three obstacle courses for you to face. They vary in board and coin placements, but not in board and coin amounts. There will always be 10 boards and 5 coins no matter which variation you get. Mash as soon as the minigame starts or you'll be fish food. I can't tell you how many times I've seen people lose immediately because they assumed this minigame would give them some leeway at the beginning. The big cheap cheeps will jump to the left when the timer's at 26, to the right at 23, to the left again at 20, and to the right again at 17. There is no variation to their pattern. Getting hit by them isn't even much of a drawback anyways, so feel free to grab a few coins if you want. Just don't accidentally touch a board since they'll knock you down in the same way a cheap cheap does. The final stretch, which takes place at about 15 seconds, is an all-out button masher. Once you reach close to the top, you'll start to slow down quite a bit, but don't stop mashing until the end of the minigame. Countless times will players slow down a little because they assume they've basically won, just for another player to zip right on up with superior mashing. Bombs away, the floating isle is under fire again, this time from Bowser's bombs. Hang on tight to win the prize. The first Mario Party's version of this minigame only has cannonballs to avoid, but this title's got bullet bills and a single missile at the end. Any cannonballs that hit the water will cause the island to tilt in the opposite direction, so players need to adjust their position if they don't want to fall off. Cannonballs that hit the island while you're grounded will temporarily immobilize you. To avoid this, jump as soon as the cannonball strikes. Also avoid getting directly hit by a cannonball. If you don't, then you'll get launched off of the island and lose. The bullet bills only hit the island. They're a bit quicker than the cannonballs too since they take a more direct path to their destination. Avoid them the same way you'd avoid a cannonball hitting the island. You can see where each cannonball or bullet bill is being launched the moment it's shot. You can also see a shadow travel along the top of the water. Use these two details to predict where each shot will land. The huge cannon will prepare to fire a missile when the timer's at 7 seconds. That missile will land at around 2 seconds. You need to be airborne the moment that missile lands. If you're grounded, it's insanely likely you're going to lose. If you jump on a player's head, then their movement speed will be reduced and they won't be able to jump, making it way more difficult for them to adjust to upcoming shots. Only jump on a player's head if they're near the middle of the island. Jumping on their head while they're on the edge puts you at risk for catapulting yourself into the ocean. Bumper Balls is an all-out bumper balls bash. Use your analog stick to roll your ball and bounce your opponents away. The first Mario Party's version of this minigame only has one stage for you to play on, but this title has three. Your strategy for winning should change depending on how many players are left and what stage you're on. At the very beginning of the match, secure the middle of the platform so you aren't quickly eliminated. If two or more players are battling out near a ledge, then build up your momentum and bump into them. It's easiest to do this on the island variation since you can roll down its hills for an extra punch. The icy part of the snowy variation is a bit slippery. 
carry, so make sure you're committed to your movements on that part since changing directions is a bit of a chore. Bumping one player can cause a chain reaction, so you can put yourself in a great position if you seize the moment. If you're trying to bump someone off and see someone else aiming for you, then immediately retreat and get to a safe position. Your opponents can cause some serious knockback if they rolled down a hill beforehand. Remember that you don't win by the amount of people you knock off, you win by being the last player remaining. When 3-4 to four players remain, you can use the Slingshotter technique by building up your momentum and rolling in between two players and bumping into one of them. If done correctly, then you should be flinging between two players, bumping each of them further away. This can be deadly when it's used near the ledge, and it's even great to use in the middle of the platform too since you'll gain stage control over everyone else, who will most likely be near the ledge once you've knocked them away. The stage that benefits the most from this technique is the snowy variation. The ice doesn't take too kindly to you slowing down or changing directions much, which is completely okay if you're bouncing between your opponents. While this technique can be used over and over again throughout a match, it could also cause your opponents to team up and target you. If this happens, then try to stay in between them as much as possible, ironically executing the technique once more. You won't be able to use the slingshotter technique once it turns into a 1v1. You have the advantage when you're at center field in most cases. The snowy variation's ice makes it difficult to build up momentum, so your opponent could build up their momentum by the ledge and deal some knockback to you. As long as you're aware of their movements though, it shouldn't be too big of a deal. If you two keep bumping into each other yet you're bumping them further away, then never let up. If you see them turn away for a retreat, then predict their movements and ram into them with full force. If the two of you are bumping into each other repeatedly near the middle of the platform without any noticeable change, then you're at a stalemate. You could keep bumping into them and hold the stalemate for a draw if you don't want them to have any chance at winning, or you could take the more risky approach by backing off and attempting to build momentum to give yourself the advantage. This is most possible on the island variation where you could go behind a hill and get a quick boost there. This could definitely backfire on you if your opponent knows what you're doing and strikes while you're vulnerable. If you're caught in a bad position, then make your movements unpredictable and get to safety. Deep Sea Salvage, a coin minigame. Pilot your submarines and grab the coins the Hammer Bros throw. The Hammer Bros will throw coins, coin bags which are worth 5 coins, and mines. The last of which will stun a player for a second and make them lose the ability to pick up any items for a few seconds. Seize the top of the ocean. The Hammer Bros throw all the items in arcs, making it easy to tell where they're going to end up. If you see a coin bag thrown far to the left, then preemptively move in that direction to grab it. If you see a mine thrown towards you, then dodge preemptively so you don't get hit. You sink faster than coins, so feel free to grab them if they're below you. You sink at the same rate as coin bags, so if there's one below you falling towards the abyss, then it's a lost cause. If it's by these ledges though, then you can grab them once they land. You don't have to mash A as fast as possible to rise. It's more relaxed than that, so don't tire yourself out. Dizzy Dancing. The record spins and spins, and so does your head. Be the first of the Dizzy Dancers to grab the floating musical note. Due to the player's dizziness, the controls are altered, and players have to figure out how each direction on the controller translates to the screen. Sometimes up is down, sometimes up is left. You won't know until you try. Holding your analog stick towards the musical note will likely not move you towards it. After all, your controls were changed. I recommend you hold your analog stick in the opposite direction of the musical note, make small adjustments to figure out what your controls are, and then repeatedly jump towards the musical note to win the game. If you only jump at the end, then you run the risk of other players hitting you and changing your direction, which can be a pain. You could attack other players by punching, jumping, or ground pounding them, but it's just not worth it. You'd only be making it easier for other players to reach the musical note before you, so stay focused on your goal. Hexagon Heat. Run to the hexagon that matches the color of the flag Toad raises. Last one standing wins. This minigame is identical in concept to Mushroom Mix-Up from the first Mario Party. Hey, wait a minute. If Mario Party 2 gets to shamelessly reuse assets from the first Mario Party, then shouldn't I be allowed to shamelessly reuse assets from my identifying luck video for the first Mario Party? That seems fair, right? Right. Let's take a look at the script here. Just replace a few words here and there, and perfect. There's no pattern to the flags Toad raises. It's completely random. Position yourself on the white hexagon in the middle whenever you get a chance so you'll be a short distance away from any hexagon Toad selects. Once you get to the hexagon indicated, block the edges of it to make it harder for other players to get there. 
If they attempt to jump onto the hexagon you're on and you manage to block them mid-jump, then they'll bounce off of you and land where they started, which at this point will most likely be the lava. If you position yourself for them to jump on your head, then you can cause them to catapult off the hexagon into the lava as well. If you're the one caught trying to access a hexagon, then take routes that avoid the other player so you don't get blocked off. If you realize that the jump you made is about to land on another player's head and lose you the game, then you can interrupt your jump with a ground pound. If you jump on someone, then they're partially flattened and their movement speed is decreased. If you ground pound someone, then they'll get flattened onto the ground and cannot move at all. Regardless of how you stun another player, they won't be able to jump, a movement option that's incredibly necessary to succeeding in this minigame, especially when Toad starts speeding up as the game continues. Here's the most crucial tip for this minigame. You can begin your jumps towards the hexagons while they're under the lava and land on them the moment they emerge if you have good timing. This won't help you win, but it's useful for styling on your opponents, and what else is more important than that? That'll teach you not to recycle old content without any new mechanics. I hope you've learned your lesson, Mario Party. 32. Honeycomb Havoc. Hit the block and then take as many fruits as the numbers shown. Avoid the honeycomb to be the last one left. Your only options are to take one fruit or two. You have the greatest chance at winning if you follow my one and done technique. When it's your turn, count how many other players are left and multiply that number by two. This lets us know the maximum number of objects that can be claimed before your next turn. Mark that number of objects from below the next honeycomb. What you're left with are the remainders. You have a 100% chance of staying in the game your next turn if you reduce the amount of remainders to one. We'll take away one with this dice roll. Now, even if all the other players choose to take away two, we'll still be in the game. Now this, on the other hand, is a predicament. Two other players times two is four. Mark four objects from below the next honeycomb and we're left with a remainder of five. The lowest we can make that remainder is three by taking away two. Whereas a remainder of one is guaranteed to keep you safe, a remainder of anything else throws your fate into the hands of your opponents. In this scenario, if the next player rolls a 1, we're screwed. If they roll a 2, then we're saved. It's hopelessly out of our hands, right? Wrong! This coin here is our ticket to destiny. If we roll a 2, then we'll move that coin into the reach of the next player. However, they can only get that coin if they roll a 2, which is what we need them to roll in order for us to stay in the game. By betting on humanity's pitiful lust for greed. We've increased our chances of this player rolling what we want them to. Using the one and done technique is a little different in 1v1s. Mark two objects from below the last honeycomb. If you can make the next object your one remainder, then go for it and you're guaranteed to be safe your next turn. No changes there. If after your initial two markings, the next object isn't close enough for you to make your one remainder, then mark it along with the two objects after it. The objects after that last marking are now your remainders. Reduce them to one as shown before, and you're guaranteed to be safe your next turn. If you're ever in the position where you can choose which player loses, then get rid of the most threatening player. There are going to be times where you'll lose this minigame no matter what you try to do. Don't be discouraged, and keep giving it your best shot. Hot Rope Jump. The flaming potaboo rope spins and spins. Jump the rope without touching a potaboo. This title's version of this minigame is a bit more harsh than the first Mario Party's version. Here, the potaboo rope will swing endlessly until someone wins by being the last one standing, or until there's no one left standing, in which case the minigame will end in a draw. The rope starts off blue and turns red at five jumps. Although the red potaboos look bigger, there doesn't seem to be a hitbox difference. The rope will remain at the same speed up until 10 jumps, where it will start randomly speeding up and slowing down in an effort to throw you off. Players tend to lose more by jumping early than waiting to jump later, so pay close attention to the speed the rope takes the moment it's about to loop back around. If you last long enough, you'll have to deal with it going at blazing speeds, in which case you'll actually need to do short hops to keep up. Full hops at the fastest speed won't cut it. Lava Tile Isle. Battle your opponents atop the Grindle tiles to knock them off the floating aisle. Last one standing wins. The Grindles will always start out in a capital I formation. Every couple seconds, two Grindles will move to an open spot next to them. A Grindle without any open spots next to them cannot move. If you're standing on a Grindle as it's moving, then you'll stay in the same spot and it'll go along without you. I know it doesn't make any sense, but that's what happens, so try not to get tripped up by it. Players can stun each other for a short time with different results. If you punch someone, they get pushed back a few feet. If you jump on someone, then they're partially flattened and cannot punch. If you attack someone with a ground pound, then they'll get flattened onto the ground and cannot move. Punching has a 
short cooldown, so if you time your punches, then you can really mess up someone's day. Jumping or ground pounding on a player's head runs the risk of catapulting yourself into the lava. While I normally advise against jumping maneuvers in situations like these, ground pounding can be a powerful option so long as you only do it when there's land all around you. Getting stunned by a ground pound is doubly painful if you're on a grindle that's about to move. Prioritize safety above all else. While it's nice to knock people off into the lava, it's the last one standing that wins. If more than one player is left standing when the time runs out, then the game ends in a draw. Mecha Marathon. See how far your mecha fly guy will fly. Whoever flies farthest wins. Press the A and B buttons at the same time to wind your mecha fly guy. If you press one of the two buttons even a split second before the other, then your input won't count. You've got to make sure both buttons are pressed together in perfect mashing harmony. Platform Peril. Jump across the platforms that fall from the sky as you race to be the first to cross the finish line. This title's version of this minigame has more obstacles than that of the first Mario parties. There's the inclusion of moving platforms as well as conveyor belts either going forwards or backwards. Since the quickest way to beat this minigame is by moving in a straight line, you don't want to change directions often. If you come across a moving platform and it's not in your path, then move just enough to land on the edge of it and continue platforming from there. Mind how fast your character is moving on the conveyor belts so you don't jump too early or jump too late. This minigame has the same layout every time, but memorizing it won't really help you out since the minigame plays at a rather relaxed pace. There doesn't seem to be one path that's better than all the others. While this first moving platform is unfair to the player on the far right, the second moving platform corrects that by being unfair to the player on the far left. The two middle players need to make sure they don't touch the pyramid blocks or the players next to them when they make the transition to the smaller platforms. If there is an advantage to a certain position, then it doesn't seem to be big enough to warrant much concern. Here's how to grab each coin without losing yourself the minigame. First coin, do a short hop and then immediately jump to the next platform. Form. Second coin, do a full hop off the edge of this backwards moving conveyor belt. Third coin, do a short hop and then immediately jump to the next platform. Fourth coin, do a full hop off the edge of the platform before the one it's on. Fifth coin, do a short hop and then immediately jump towards the goal. You can jump on a player's head to reduce their movement speed and restrict their jump, but you'll find it's just not worth it because it's both difficult and unrewarding since bouncing off their head will most likely result in a loss for you. Roll call, count how many characters are milling about. Whoever is right when roll call comes, wins. Players have to count the toads, boos, or babams. For the toads, players need to count the moving ones instead of the mushrooms on the ground. Pausing the game will remove all toads from the screen to prevent you from cheating the timer. A side effect of this fix is that it reveals where all the mushrooms are in case you are confusing them with the toads. For the boos, they can appear and disappear. Sometimes a few boos will cross over to the other side of the screen, making them a little tricky to count. Keep an eye out for those ones especially so you don't end up having to restart. For the babombs, players only count babombs that do not explode. The babombs don't move around as fast as the boos do, so they're easier to count altogether, but you need to make sure you subtract one from what you counted for every babam that explodes. No matter which characters you're counting, I encourage you to keep your eye steady the whole mini game through. If you dart your eyes all over the place, then you'll lose track of how many characters there are fairly quickly. Start in a corner, count the characters up there, move your eyes to another set, count them, and so on until you have a good idea of how many there are in total. If you feel like you messed up, then calmly count once more. This minigame gives you a fair amount of time. If you're utterly clueless by the end of the time limit, then just copy another player's answer. To prevent your answer from being copied, count up to a fake number first, and then quickly count to the real number you had in your head once the timer's near up. The player who has the same count as the blue count at the top of the screen when roll call comes, wins. If all four players match, then they all win. If no count matches the blue count at the top of the screen when the character count is totaled, the minigame ends in a draw. Shell shocked. Captain a Koopa tank in an all out duel. If you get hit twice, you're shell shocked. You have the option of shooting a straight shot or a lob shot. Straight shots should be used when your opponent is directly in front of you. Lob shots should be used when your opponent is behind a warp pipe. If you hold down Z, then you can strafe, which I highly recommend. It makes it much easier to lock onto your opponents as you move around instead of the alternative, which feels clunky in comparison. The stages vary depending on how many warp pipes are placed as obstacles. Stage 1 has one pipe in the center, stage 2 has one pipe in the center of each wall, stage 3 has one pipe in the center with eight pipes surrounding it. Keep in mind you're not shooting for points, you're shooting for survival. Whereas straight shots can move across the whole map if they're left uninterrupted, lob shots have a specific distance. This means that hiding behind warp pipes from enemies 
enemies that are far away is a brilliant strategy. If you're worried about someone targeting you, then feel free to shamelessly screen peek to see what they're up to. Just don't get hit in the process. If two cannonballs hit one another, then they'll cancel each other out. If all four players are knocked out of the game or the time limit reaches zero, the minigame ends in a draw. Shy Guy says, the Shy Guy will raise a flag, so just raise the same color flag. It's simple, right? The game continues until only one remains. This title's version of this minigame, unlike the first Mario Party's version, has this bypassing Lakitu, which serves as a timestamp for the game. If the player does not trigger their flag raising button before Lakitu has gone off screen, the Shy Guy will pop their balloon. Players are given a lot of time to choose which flag they want to raise at the beginning. As more time passes, the Shy Guy will speed up and players will be given less time to make their decision. His speed will stop increasing at about 10 flag raises. Sometimes he'll try to trick all of the players by raising two color flags at once. When this happens, the amount of time players have to make a decision is increased by a tiny amount, which is more obvious this time around since the Lakitu in the background will go a bit slower. This minigame will continue indefinitely until someone wins by being the last player standing, or, you know, floating, or until the remaining players get knocked out at the same time, which would result in a draw. Don't be hasty at the beginning, there's no benefit to raising your flag as early as possible. When things start speeding up, pay very close attention to the Shy Guy's arms. When things start speeding up, pay very close attention to the Shy Guy's arms. If he raises only one arm, then there won't be a fake out and you're free to raise the respective flag. If he raises both arms, then take an extra split second moment to wait and see which flag he leaves up, then choose that one. The fake outs can get really tricky at times, so don't be hasty and focus on being quick at the last possible moment. Skateboard Scamper It's the scariest scamper ever. You're trapped in Boo's haunted house for a skateboard race to safety. While this title's version of this minigame may look different to the first Mario Parties, they're actually pretty similar. The camera angle isn't too great here. Don't let it screw you out of a win. There's a moving platform at the beginning that doesn't require precise timing to jump over. This staircase, on the other hand, will make or break your run. If you don't jump with proper timing here, then you risk getting stuck in a wall or a ledge. Either way, you'll fall behind. If at any point you notice you're falling behind, then simply skate on the ground to get even again. Jumping doesn't slow you down, but it doesn't speed you up either. It merely keeps you at the speed you're currently at. This is why it's okay to grab coins so long as you're going your maximum speed. It's also a good idea to jump uphill. Hitting that maximum speed is easy for most of the minigame. Pressing B repeatedly at an average rate will do. However, once all the obstacles are behind you and the camera shifts, then the speed limit comes off and the minigame turns into a button masher for the remaining players, with victory belonging to whoever's furthest ahead. Knowing all of this, reserve your best button mashing for the very end, since it won't help you out much beforehand. Slot Car Derby The first one to complete four laps in the Slot Car Derby wins. Three courses exist. On the straightaways and wide curves on the border of the courses, you can go as fast as you want without spinning out. For every other section, your tires will start smoking at max speed, indicating you need to release your analog stick for a brief moment before speeding up again. Memorizing the sections of the course that are sweet spots for speed, along with getting a good handle on when to briefly release your analog stick, will have you racing ahead of the other players. Don't hold up until a split second before Go appears on screen, otherwise you'll get a bad start. If a player is overlapped by another player, that player will get rammed into, eliminating them. Sneak and snore. Sneak to the red button and out the door while Chain Chomp snores. Hide in the barrel if he wakes. The more you push your analog stick, the faster you'll go. But the faster you go, the longer it'll take you to hide in your barrel when you release the analog stick. If the Chain Chomp wakes up while you're going the fastest speed, then you probably won't be able to hide in time. If the chain chomp wakes up while you're going a little slower, then your chances are much better at not getting caught. When the minigame starts, go as fast as possible. The moment you cross over into the fifth square, keep moving but slow down a little. The chain chomp will either wake up the moment you enter that fifth square or a little afterwards. There's no way to know for sure, but if you're moving a little slower, then you can react in time to him waking up. You only need to step on about half the button for it to be pressed. Any more than that is wasted time. The way back is more difficult since the chain chomp will likely wake up two or even three times at random. It's not totally hopeless though. The chain chomp can't wake up the moment he falls asleep. You can take advantage of this by going fast for a second or two the moment he starts snoozing. No more than that though. Don't get greedy. If all players are taken by the chain chomp, the minigame ends in a draw. Tile Driver. Ground Pound to flip the panels and match up all of the pieces in the puzzle. The first to finish wins. Players have to match either a Goomba, a Koopa Troopa, 
or a boo. Goomba panels flip to Koopa Troopa panels, Koopa Troopa panels flip to boo panels, and boo panels flip to Goomba panels. There is no reason to do a ground pound from high in the sky. That'll just waste time. Ground pound the moment you're airborne. This way, you'll flip your desired panel a little quicker. You don't need to be in the middle of a panel to flip it. Moving to do so will waste time. Ground pounding even an inch of your desired panel will do. Just be careful about accidentally hitting the wrong one. And before you get any funny ideas, you can't hit more than one panel at once. If the time limit runs out without anyone matching the picture, the minigame ends in a draw. Tipsy Turny. Tip the picture frame up and down, left and right to clear the panels and reveal the picture beneath. This title's version of this minigame is mechanically identical to the first Mario Parties. The only difference is that you're uncovering a graphics interchange format instead of a PNG. You should start with the border panels, moving to each corner once the shell starts moving towards you. Once all the border panels are near completion, move inwards to slide the shell towards the middle and make small adjustments to uncover the rest of the picture. If done correctly, you should complete the minigame when the timer is at about 15 to 17 seconds. Most players clear it a few seconds below that because their shell doesn't slide where they want it to. Get a good feel for it and shoot for the time specified. Toad in the box. Jump up to hit the spinning blocks. The first one to get five toad faces wins. Each time a player gets a toad face, the spinning block gets a little faster. The floor below them also rises one level. If a player hits the spinning block and gets something other than a toad face, they'll get stunned for a moment. The stun time varies depending on which face it is. The Piranha Plant and Chain Chomp face will stun you for about 2.5 seconds, whereas the Bowser face will stun you for about 3.5 seconds. No matter how fast the block is spinning, it will always roll in the same order. Toad, Piranha Plant, Chain Chomp, Bowser. The minigame will always start on Toad's face, but it'll spin by too fast for you to hit it. Even a frame 1 input wouldn't cut it here, so don't try it. Just patiently wait for the Bowser face to meander by and then jump for Toad. You can easily do the same thing for the second level. Levels 3 and 4 are when you need some actual timing skills. Try thinking the word red to yourself whenever you see the red face of Toad spin by. After you build up a rhythm of about 2 to 3 reds, then try jumping with that rhythm for Toad. It'll normally work out that way. The fifth level throws timing out the window. Don't even bother. Jump immediately and if you don't get Toad there, then wait a split second before jumping again so you don't get the same face you just rolled. Totem Pole Pound is a race to see who will be the first to use ground pounds to pound the totem bros into the ground. While short hop ground pounds are quicker, they'll end up losing you time because of how weak they are. This is why you should aim for full hop ground pounds only. They may be slower, but their strength more than compensates. Your character has a resting animation after every ground pound. During this animation, you can't make them jump so you need to wait until the time is right. This can be tricky though. If you press A too early, then they won't jump. If you press it too late, then you'll lose precious time. To solve this problem, I recommend the 0-1 jump technique. Each time your character pounds the totem bros, start counting like so. 0, 1, jump. And the moment you get to jump, do a full hop, ground pound, and repeat the process. 0, 1, jump. 0, 1, jump. 0, 1, Jump. Zero. One. Jump. Finish. 1v3 minigames. Archer Rival. Try to hit the moving targets with your arrows. Knock all three rivals down to win. The Boo panel gives one coin, the Toad panel gives two coins, and the Baby Bowser panel gives three coins. If you're the solo player, then try to resist the coins you can get from these extra panels. I know it's tempting, but hitting them would give your foes more room to flee, which puts you at greater risk for losing the minigame. Oftentimes, these AI-controlled panels will corner your opponents, making it easier for you to hit them. If you notice that someone's movement is restricted, whether it be from the AI panels or another player, then just put them out of their misery. Likewise, if no one is fully restricted, then target the player that has the least room to move around. When it's a 1v1, your opponent will likely have a lot more room to move around. Keep your aim on their panel, but make it obvious that you're favoring one side over the other. This may scare them into moving the opposite direction, which you can take advantage of by quickly moving that way and taking your shot. The AI panels may help you out by moving towards your foe, eating up their space to move. They may even feel compelled to move towards the AI panels to prevent all of their space being taken up. This is a good move for them to make, but you can capitalize on it by quickly aiming at your foe's panel and favoring their escape route. Firing a shot in this situation will likely mean victory so long as the AI panels don't suddenly change direction. If all else fails, then move left and right really fast to intimidate them and make random shots. You have unlimited arrows after all. If you're one of the three players, then you're trying to dodge the solo player's arrows until the time is up. You want to make sure you have enough room 
to move around. You can prevent AI panels from moving towards a direction by blocking them off and hoping they decide to move the other way. Just be careful that you don't stay there for too long or you'll end up getting yourself knocked out. Cornering your own teammate is never a good idea. Give them room to move around as well. If you're the one person at the end, then try to stay in the middle of an open area to give yourself the most options. The solo player must reload in between shots. Take that time to reposition yourself if you're in a bad spot. The AI panels can cause some serious damage for you here, so if you see them approaching, then stop them for as long as it's safe before returning to your open space. Babam Barrage. The player floating in the tub must dodge the barrage of babams to keep the tub afloat. A babam only hits the solo player if it lands inside the raft. If one hits the edges, it bounces off. If any of the three players takes too long to throw a babam, it'll detonate on the player, briefly stunning them. If you're the solo player, then stick around the middle of the circle. Most players have trouble flicking the babams this distance. They tend to either throw them way too far or not nearly far enough. If you're playing with someone who does know how to consistently the babam in average distance, then make sure you're not straight across from them. You want to give them an awkward angle to throw their babams, not an easy one. If you're one of the three players, then you need to learn how to throw that babam properly. Let's say you're about to throw one straight ahead. Start pulling your analog stick in the opposite direction. The distance you throw your babam is dependent upon how quickly the analog stick returns to neutral. If it gets there quickly, then you'll chuck the babam far. If it gets there at a decent pace, then you'll chuck the babam an average distance. If it gets there slowly, then you'll chuck the babam a few feet. As said before, a lot of players have trouble chucking their babams the average distance. Once you get used to its speed though, you'll be on your way. Predict the solo player's movements as best you can. Are they only hanging around the middle? Are they only moving on the far edges? Answering these kinds of questions will give you a better idea of where to throw your babam for the best shot. If your teammates are having trouble throwing a certain distance, then quickly let them know how to do it properly so your team has a better chance at winning. Bowl over! Go Go bowling with a Koopa shell. You win if you knock down all your bowling pin rivals. You get to bowl with two shells. If the solo player knocks over a normal pin, they'll get a coin. The first Mario Party's version of this minigame only had one variation, whereas this title has three. Variation 1's lane veers right and then left. Variation 2's lane veers left and then right. Variation 3's lane veers left, makes a harsh right, and then a harsh left. The first two variations make it easy for the solo player's shell to reach the end, but the angle they're coming from is much more obvious to the three players. The third variation makes it harder for the solo player's shell to reach the end, but the angle they're coming from is a little less obvious to the three players. If you're the solo player, then don't let any of your shells fall off the lane. Keep in mind that you only get two shots at knocking down your opponents. Be discreet about which angle you're coming from so they won't be able to adapt. Try getting at least two players at once with your first shot. If you only get one player, then it's highly likely that the remaining two will go on opposite ends the next round to make it virtually impossible for you to win at that point. If you're thinking you can play it like normal bowling and try to hit one pin into the other, keep in mind that the moment you hit a pin, its hitbox deactivates, so such a strategy wouldn't work here. This is why you've got to throw your second shell as quickly as possible to not let your opponents get the chance of screwing you over. If they manage to get into position and all hope is lost, then go for the normal pins for some coins. This is the only situation where I'd recommend only targeting them. If you're one of the three players, then tell the other two to spread out. This will reduce the possibility of the solo player nailing multiple players at once. This will also put them in a position where they have to use their best judgment on who to target since everyone's so spread out, instead of easily hitting everyone's pins at once. If two players on your team remain on the solo player's second shell throw, then immediately spread out to opposite ends to secure your win. Crane Game It's the new and improved Crane Game. Drop all your stuffed rivals into the pipe to win. Leave none behind. This title's version of this minigame differs wildly from the first Mario Party's version. Here, the solo player must capture all three opponents. To make this task easier, time bonuses of 15, 20, and 30 seconds were introduced. When the player drops one of them into the pipe, more time will be added to the game timer according to what the watch shows. If you're the solo player, then grabbing every time bonus is recommended. Getting all of them at the beginning will leave you with 60 seconds to grab the three players, which is double the amount of time you had before. How difficult something is to hold on to depends on three factors. How fast you're mashing, how fast they're mashing, and where you're holding on to them. The mashing ones are obvious, so let's focus on the third one. If you grab an object from the side, you'll notice that it'll wobble. A lot. 
This isn't just aesthetics, it means you have a poor grip on it, which will lower your chances of holding onto it no matter how fast you mash. Make sure that you grab every object, player or not, from the middle. This task can be made easier with the light that shines down below. Just line up your target within the middle of that light and you're good to go. You don't need to tap A at all when grabbing a timer by the middle, so don't waste your strength on them. When it's time to grab the three players, target the best button masher first. It'd be a shame if you tied yourself out beforehand, after all. What sucks, though, is that the placements for the three players' characters are chosen at random, so the best button masher may have the best position. I believe in you, though. If you're one of the three players and you're getting picked up by the solo player, then mash as fast as possible the moment they grab you. Filet Relay. It's a three-on-one penguin race. Be the first to throw the fish to your friends at the finish. If you waddle way too fast, then you'll fall down. You're given a warning that you're about to go too fast when your penguin starts slipping. If you're the solo player, then you have a low chance of falling down because of your reduced movement speed. Feel free to mash to your heart's content, but still keep an eye out for your character if they start slipping a bunch, as unlikely as that may be. If you're one of the three players, then you have a higher chance of falling down because of your faster movement speed. Mash to move quickly, but pay close attention so you don't accidentally fall. Regardless of what side you're on, try not to touch anything. Whether it be an opponent, a wall, or a snow pile, you'll either get pushed back, sidelined, or slowed down. On this first section, simply go through the lane closest to you. If you're one of the three players, then use your speed to cut ahead the solo player and force them to bump into you as you go to make your switch. If you're the solo player, then pay attention to your opponent so this doesn't happen to you. Also keep in mind that you can still bump into players that are waiting for their teammates, so avoid them as well. The second section is incredibly narrow, making it hard to get back ahead if you've fallen behind. You want your opponent behind you here, not the other way around. All players have the greatest potential of falling down on this third section because of its steep slopes. Keep your speed in mind and avoid the piles of snow that the snowmen are throwing. They existed earlier, but they have a higher chance of screwing you over here. Lights out, you're the one in the dark, but hit your bulb carrying rivals with the hammer, and it's lights out for them. If you're the solo player, then you have two different kinds of swings to bash your opponents with. The vertical swing and the horizontal swing. The vertical swing has less range, but emits a few stars when it hits the ground, which can help you figure out where you are in the dark. This will show everyone else where you are too though, so don't do it unless you're totally lost. The horizontal swing doesn't emit any stars and it has a wider attack range, which should make it your go-to swing for taking out players. If you notice that a player is hugging the edge of their arena, then move along the edges in darkness and surprise them with a swing. Run for any player you want when the lights turn on, but when they turn back off, try targeting a different player instead. This has the potential to throw everyone off since it looked like you were headed one direction when instead it was a bait. If you get close enough, then you can knock multiple players out at once. If you're one of the three players, then make your movements unpredictable. Hugging the edge the entire time will only make it easier for the solo player to bash you in. Run through the middle, go in circles, and flee whenever you see stars for the best chance at survival. Look away. Look in the same direction as any bottom player to get him or her out. Get all three out in five turns. Players have the option to look in one of five directions. Up, down, left, right, and straight ahead. This last one is performed by not touching the control stick at all. You can freely turn your head wherever you want once this red light flashes. The music will stop once this blue light flashes, but you're still allowed to change your direction for another half a second. If you're the solo player, then take advantage of players that don't know this information by choosing the direction they choose a split second after the song's over. Even players who know what they're doing might accidentally commit to a direction early, so pay close attention to their movements. If an opponent is spinning their control stick or just wildly switching directions, then it's unlikely that they'll look straight ahead. More often than not, someone with that kind of energy won't just release the analog stick at the end. The most awkward direction for your left thumb to hold is left, making it less likely to be chosen by players that aren't wildly swinging their analog stick around. If you notice any patterns, such as one player consistently choosing the same option, then capitalize on it by moving your head everywhere else and then choosing that option at the last moment. If you're one of the three players, then make sure your teammates know that they can still change their direction half a second after the music stops and the light flashes blue. If the solo player goes for the same direction twice in a row, then a third is unlikely since they'll now see that option as the one that failed twice. If you're worried about getting your mind red, then flail your analog stick every which way you want to leave it up to chance. Feel free to let go of your analog stick at the end of your performance to look straight forward, if you so please. The tips I've given here have a lower chance to actually help than most others. You could try 
try your hardest here and you may still lose. Such is the nature for mini games like these. Move to the music. Copy the moves of the Dance Master. If even one player is left standing, the Dance Master loses. There are seven dance moves for the solo player to choose from. Up, down, left, right, B, A, Z. The solo player has two chances to confuse all the three players. If you're the solo player, then you're at a disadvantage. Remembering four to six inputs each round, no matter what they may be, won't be difficult for most players. While a bunch of arrows pointing every which way may be enough at times, there just isn't enough stress in the memorization department for this mini game to be balanced. This is why I recommend the lose your friends technique. It's quite simple. When you're making your inputs, your opponents are probably remembering them through repetition in their head right? To counter that, say a random input each time you make one, and while you're at it, say a bunch of random inputs during their turn too. While I can't guarantee they'll like you after doing this, I can guarantee that this technique will increase your chances of winning by a solid 24%. The minigame's rules say to copy the moves of the Dance Master, but if the Dance Master ignores an input and another player copies that, then that player will be eliminated. Well that's strange, didn't they just do as they were told? Yeah, it sucks. When it comes to the solo player ignoring an input, the proper response is to actually execute any input. This exception to what the minigame tells you at the start isn't mentioned anywhere, so if you want to take advantage of that, then go right on ahead. If you're one of the three players, then try to remember the entire dance so you'll be ready to move when your turn comes along. Make sure your teammates know how to respond to non-inputs from the solo player. Quicksand Cash, a coin minigame. The player in the Bowser suit controls the quicksand. Try to pull down all of your coin collecting rivals. If you're the solo player, then move the three players away from the bundles of coins and coin bags, which are worth five coins apiece. If two players are going for the same coin bag, but they're on opposite sides, then prioritize moving the player that's closer vertically. If they're both vertically lined up, but they're a little far away, then don't spin the sand at all to nab the coin bag. If all players are on one side, then move them to the opposite side of where all the coins are falling. Keep track of how they're trying to get to the coins and make sure they're going as slow as possible by pushing the sand against them. They may try to go with the flow, which will ironically help them move a lot faster. So have a game plan, but be unpredictable in its execution. If one of the three players is doing well with their coins, both on the board and with the minigame star, then make sure they don't extend their lead even further. If you're one of the three players, then go for bundles of coins and coin bags. If the solo player is moving you away from what you want, then try going with the flow to zip back around. Round. You'll either catch the solo player by surprise and secure what you originally wanted, or you'll be in a new area to grab more coins. If you get sucked into the core, then you won't be able to grab any more coins, but you'll keep the amount you collected. Be greedy, but not so greedy that you end up falling in. Rainbow Run. Keep your eyes on your goal as you run the rainbow bridge. Players in the cloud will try to knock you off with cannonballs. This minigame is identical in concept to Tightrope Treachery from the first Mario Party. Unlike Tightrope Treachery, the three players clown automatically move instead of players having to control them. Any cannonballs that hit the rainbow itself will only serve to distract the solo player by shaking the screen violently. Direct shots to the player are the ones that will directly affect their placement. How the player falls over actually feels a little inconsistent now that I think about it. Sometimes shots from the left will make the player fall to the right, or the left? It's a little weird. There's also strong winds that the solo player must adjust to while they're moving forward. If you're the solo player, then you generally want to stay in the middle of the rainbow as you move along. You don't need to worry about the three players constantly bombarding you from one side since they don't have control over their movement. However, since their movement is automated, they can focus more of their attention on nailing their shots. It's possible to veer left and right to dodge shots that hit the side of the rainbow. This can be a risky maneuver though, so you should only attempt this if you're running low on time. If you get hit by a cannonball, then immediately make your way back to the middle of the rainbow and continue on. Every time you get hit, you have invincibility frames, so you'll almost always have a chance to readjust yourself. It's quite possible for you to get hit immediately after you're able to move again. This is why it's crucial that returning to the middle of the rainbow is your top priority. If you're one of the three players, then remember that your cannonball will travel the same distance every time you shoot, so always keep in mind what angle 
you're shooting at to land your shots. If the solo player is doing well, then you could have one player on your team constantly hit the rainbow over and over again. This will give the solo player an awful time trying to figure out where they are. In the midst of their confusion, the other two players on your team could launch direct shots at them. Shock, drop, or roll. Throw the lever to spin the power turbine. Stop your rivals in their tracks and roll them all off. If you're the solo player, then be as unpredictable as possible. Make your opponents think you're about to commit to spinning the turbine one way, just for you to turn it the other way. Do this while throwing in a bunch of other mix-ups to throw your opponents off as much as possible. If you notice that a player's gotten confused, then take advantage of that confusion and make a hard commit to spinning towards one side. Sadly, this minigame isn't really in the solo player's favor if any of the three players know this upcoming strategy. If you're one of the three players, then stay in the air as much as possible so you aren't affected by the spinning turbine nearly as much. Don't move and then jump since you'll risk putting yourself in an awful position if the solo player spins the turbine in the direction you jumped. You instead want to jump and move in the air. Do this over and over over again and aim to stay in the middle. You might make the solo player cry though. 2v2 minigames! Balloon Burst! This minigame used to be a 4 player minigame back in the first Mario Party, but now you've got a teammate to rely on. Press the A and Z buttons alternately to pump the Bowser balloon until it bursts. You can also use B instead of Z. Your pump will flash when it's full of air. You'll pump more air if the pump is full. You need to nail the sweet spot where you're pumping as much air as you can as fast as you can. To do this, you need to alternate your button presses rhythmically at a speed of 308 beats per minute, which happens to be exactly two times faster than the song that plays during this minigame. Take advantage of this by entering your inputs on both the on and off beats of the song and you'll be well on your way to victory. The minigame should end with about 20 to 21 seconds remaining, if both players on the team knew the trick about this minigame song. Mad props to the developers if it was intentional. The game ends when either a team pops their balloon or the time runs out, in which case the minigame will end in a draw and neither team earns any coins. Bobsled run. It's a super long bobsled run. Keep pressing the A button until you jump in the sled. In this title's version, there are less guardrails, so it's easier to fall off and into oblivion than in the first Mario Party. Whichever team mashes A faster at the beginning will get a head start over the other team, which is a fantastic advantage to have. When on the track, both players should hold up to go the max speed. They should steer by tilting their analog sticks up left and up right. Only slow down a teensy bit when making harsh turns, otherwise you should be holding up the entire time. There are three boost pads on the track. The first and third are on the main path, but the second one lies on an alternate path that I recommend you take to go a bit faster. Sliding through even a couple pixels of a boost pad is enough to receive the boost, so don't waste time trying to line up with one perfectly. If you're ahead, then get a grasp on the other team's movements, ideally by screen peeking. Block them off whenever they attempt to slide past you. If they end up successful and your team falls behind, then look for an opening and try to sneak by them as best you can. Running into walls isn't as much of a punishment as you'd expect, but you don't want to slide along them for too long. You'll slow down soon enough. If a team falls off, then the other team still needs to reach the goal in order to gain any coins. If they fall off too, then the minigame will end in a draw. If the opposing team falls off, then the rest of the minigame for your team should be a leisurely slide down the track. Cake Factory. Demand for cakes is high. One player places cakes, the other strawberries. The most productive team wins. Players grab and place their ingredient by pressing A once, and can hold their ingredient for longer if they hold the button. The only reason to hold on to your ingredient is if you have to wait on your teammate. This is why the two of you should keep an eye on one another so neither of you place your ingredient too early. If a player places two cakes on the plate or places a strawberry on the plate first, the team has to try again. If a player does not grab the ingredient from the conveyor belt on time, that player gets stunned for a short time. While every character gets stunned for the same amount of time, not every character's stunned animation looks the same. Some characters make it obvious when they're not stunned anymore, like Luigi, whereas other characters aren't so obvious, like Mario. Make sure you know the exact 
exact movement your character makes when they're not stunned anymore so you don't waste any inputs. When the timer's anywhere between 30 and 14 seconds, then press A the moment an ingredient starts to line up with your character. When the timer's anywhere between 13 and 0 seconds, then press A the moment an ingredient lines up with the middle of the platter. If any tip's gonna help you win a lot more, it's this one. Tons of players start missing their ingredients during the final stretch, but if you and your teammate both know this timing, then you're set. Destruction Duet. Your job is to be the first demolition duo to demolish the Bowser statue. This minigame has three variations, Type 1, Type 2, and Type 3. The difference between the variations is the size. Type 1 has the smallest, a statue of Bowser crouching, Type 2 has medium, a statue of Bowser standing normally, and Type 3 has the largest, a statue of Bowser standing upright with his arms up. The statues for Types 1, 2, and 3 have 30, 60, and 90 total health, respectively. Players have three attacks they can perform, punches, jump kicks, and ground pounds. The damage of each attack can be described as follows. Punches deal 1 damage, jump kicks deal 2 damage, ground pounds deal 3 damage. There are tons of ways you can go about this minigame. Both players punching, both players kicking, one player punching while the other one is kicking, one player getting on top of the statue and ground pounding while the other one's punching or kicking, or one player going to the other team's side to harass them, yeah you can do that, by punching, kicking, jumping, and ground pounding them while their partner punches, kicks, or ground pounds the statue. Out of all the strategies your team can do, the best one is... Both of you jump kicking. Ground pounds while they deal 3 damage apiece are too slow to be worth using. Punching, while incredibly fast, only deal a measly 1 point of damage. Jump kicking, on the other hand, is nearly as fast as punching, with the added bonus that it deals 2 points of damage. You're doing yourself a disservice if you're using any attack other than jump kicks. It's actually busted. Dungeon Dash. It's a dash through the dungeon. Teammates must tilt their analog sticks at the same time to move ahead. Avoid enemies that block the path. This minigame is similar to Desert Dash from the first Mario Party, but with some more obstacles. Both players on a team need to push their analog sticks to the side indicated by the dialogue. The first player on the team to execute the correct input will inevitably start a timer for the second player. As in, if the second player does not also execute the correct input within half a second, then the team will get stunned for a quick moment and will have to try executing the same input again. If the second player does execute the correct input within half a second, then the team will progress by one step and the next input will be in the opposite direction of the last one they completed. Put simply, if your team plays the game perfectly, then your input should go right, left, right, left, and so on. If your team stumbles on the third input, then it may go right, left, right, stumble, right, left, right, left, and so on. Your team can actually input the correct direction split seconds before the dialogue telling you to do so pops up. Doing so repeatedly will make you go a bit faster, but it's a little more risky too, so only do so if you're confident in your team's synchronization. Small fireballs can jump out of the lava and go to the other lava pool, attempting to burn players to slow them down. Stopping for a quick moment should be enough to avoid them. The thwomp floating in the air will slam onto the ground, rise up, and repeat the process. It will take 6 seconds for it to rise up and 1 second of stillness before slamming back onto the ground. The amount of time players are stunned for if they get crushed is almost identical to if they mess up an input. In fact, getting crushed by a thwomp will actually move players forward a few feet, which is a much better alternative than waiting for the thwomp to rise up and move yourself. Summed up, pretend the thwomp doesn't even exist. Handcar Havoc. Handcars careen down the winding mine track. The first team to reach the end wins. In the first Mario Party's version of this minigame, players could fall off the track. That is impossible in this title's version, so there's no need to worry about that. In a curve, the handcar has to be leaned to the left or right so that it will continue without losing speed. If you're taking a left turn, then lean left. If you're taking a right turn, then lean right. Both players on a team need to lean. If only one person is leaning the hand car on the curve, then you'll start to lose speed. Don't treat this mini game as a short burst button masher. Treat it as an endurance button masher. So go at a fast speed, but not fast enough to tire yourself out. It's common for teams to be so focused on the mashing at times that they'll forget about leaning on curves and lose the speed they just built. Remember that leaning is just as important. Looney Lumberjacks. Teammates must cooperate to cut the raw log. The farther you push or pull the saw, the more efficient your cut is. You need to nail the sweet spot where you're cutting as much of the log as fast as you can. To do this, you and your teammate need to press your respective buttons rhythmically at a speed of 160 BPM. You'll know you hit this rhythm if you're moving on to your next button when the saw is gone as far as it can go.
If done correctly, the game should end with about 49 seconds remaining. A respectable time indeed. If at any point you both press the same button, then the saw won't budge. This can definitely throw off your rhythm. Just stay calm and keep aiming for the wide cuts for your best shot at victory. You only need to tap your button for the full input to go through. Holding it down isn't necessary and will put you at risk for hitting the same button as your teammate. Magnet Carta, a coin minigame. Using the magnets on the front of your car, try to grab the coins and chest, and cart them over to your team's hole. Players can collect single coins, coin bags, which are worth 5 coins, and a treasure chest, which is worth 10 coins. The better the item you grab, the more your car will be slowed down. To get the treasure chest as quickly as possible, you and your teammate should collect two objects that are right next to each other. This will open up enough space for you to grab the prize. If you and your teammate don't coordinate like this at the beginning, then look around for a large enough opening so you don't miss out. Taking away a single object doesn't give you enough space, as close as it may seem. If your opponent gets the treasure chest and you really don't want them gaining 10 coins, then consider blocking them from collecting it. You don't want to do this too often though since you'll likely be losing out on coins yourself. This kind of drastic action should only be used on players that are doing so well with their coins both on the board and with the minigame star. If you're ever feeling generous, then you can give coins to your opponents. Oh, the philanthropy. Sky Pilots. The player steering the plane and the player flapping the wings must cooperate to reach the finish line first. If you're steering the plane, then keep in mind that up is down and down is up. Left and right remain the same. You'll boost forward if you touch a rainbow or fly through a rainbow. Rainbows come in pairs, which make it possible to extend your boost even further. However, you will lose control of your movements while boosting, so you need to make sure you hit the first boost at an angle which launches you towards the second one. This angle will always be towards the left, so make sure you veer right first so you have enough room for the maneuver. Colliding with a cannonball will knock you back. They have pretty good aim, so change directions quickly to avoid them. Colliding with the face of a Bowser balloon will knock you back as well. Its string doesn't count. If you're flapping the wings of the plane, then remember that you'll get the most speed with fuller wing flaps. Always lift the wings high before dropping them down. Speed Hockey. Knock the shell into your opponent's goal. The first team to score three goals wins. The player by the goal should stay around the middle. Going too far on either side will leave the goal vulnerable. The player in midfield is less restrained and should make their best attempts at bouncing the shell into the enemy's goal. Regardless of your position, this minigame is about reflexes. Watch how the shell's bouncing off the walls and react accordingly. It'll get faster the longer it's been in play. When it gets too fast to react, play defensively. The chaos of its speed will determine the winner at that point. The first team to get three goals, or the team with more goals when the timer runs out, wins. If the timer runs out and both teams have the same amount of goals, then the game ends in a draw. Toad Bandstand, it's dueling bandstands. Take turns playing Toad's Opus. The best performance wins. This minigame's like Mario Bandstand from the first Mario Party, except that it's a 2v2 minigame instead of a four player minigame. There's also no player as the conductor. An example is played first each time, so play in time as the cursor lines up with the marks on the sheet of the music. Each time a player misses a note, they'll get hit by an acorn from a tree, which does nothing else but notify the player of their mistake. The team with the most accurate timing wins. The chances of drawing in this minigame are incredibly low since the score is determined by timing, which is a lot less black and white than a player simply hitting a note or not. This is why you've got to make sure the cursor is lined up perfectly whenever you play a note. Torpedo Targets The submarine pilot and torpedo launcher must cooperate to hit as many targets as possible. Every time a target is destroyed, another target appears, and the teams have to find it. If you're piloting the submarine, then keep in mind that up is down and down is up, but left and right remain the same. You don't need to be moving forward in order to move up or down. Search for the target as best you can. Keep an eye on not only your screen, but the other teams as well, so you have a better grasp of where the target may be. Make sure your submarine is properly lined up with the target so your teammate has a better time at landing their shot. If you're the torpedo launcher, then keep in mind that you can steer torpedoes after launching them. Up is down, down is up, but left and right remain the same. Getting a handle on controlling your torpedoes will make this minigame a lot easier on your team, especially because some targets like to move around. You can also stun the other team by launching torpedoes at them, but this isn't recommended since the stun time only lasts for a short while. It's more of a good side effect to a bad shot than anything else. The team that destroys the most targets wins. If both teams score the same amount of points, then the game ends in a draw. Battle mini games. Bowser's Big Blast. Take turns pressing the plungers. If Bowser blows up on you, you're out. Last one standing wins. Only one plunger out of a set can trigger the explosion. 
I'm... I'm so sorry. I knew this minigame was coming up, and I, I vowed to myself that I'd be able to find some kind of pattern, SOME kind of way for you to increase your odds at winning! But alas, there isn't. But, does the order matter? We'll determine if that's the case by calculating each player's chances of being the first to get blown up. The first player has a 1 out of 5 or a 20% chance of blowing up first. The second player can only blow up first if the first player lives, so we will multiply the first player's chances of living, 4 out of 5, with the second player's chances of blowing up, 1 out of 4. When that fraction is reduced, we get 1 out of 5, or a 20% chance of the second player blowing up first. The third player can only blow up first if the first player and the second player live, so we will multiply the first player's chances of living, 4 out of 5, the second player's chances of living, 3 out of 4, and the third player's chances of blowing up, 1 out of 3. When that fraction is reduced, we get 1 out of 5, or a 20% chance of the third player blowing up first. The fourth player can only blow up first if the first player, the second player, and the third player live, so we will multiply the first player's chances of living, 4 out of 5, the second player's chances of living, 3 out of 4, the third player's chances of living, 2 out of 3, and the fourth player's chances of blowing up, 1 out of 2. When that fraction is reduced, we get 1 out of 5, or a 20% chance of the fourth player blowing up first. The remaining 20% is the probability that all four players don't get blown up, in which case, the plungers reset and the minigame begins anew. Overall, every player has the same probability of winning regardless of what position they're in. This is true for the beginning of the minigame and it's true for the end. Everything balances out perfectly. So your strategy? Pick whatever plunger calls out to your heart and hope for the best. Bumper Balloon Cars. Use your car's spiked front to bust opponent's balloons. Tilt your analog stick up to move forward and down to move backward. Tilt it to the side to change direction. If you bump into someone's car while they're moving, then you'll both get knocked back. If you bump into someone's car while they're still, or spinning, then you'll flip their car around, which is a great move to put your opponents in a bad position. You obviously don't want this happening to you though, so make sure you're on the move when other players bump into you. There's no point in knocking another player out if you just get knocked out right afterwards. If you're gonna go for someone, make sure it's safe to do so first. Target the opponent that would benefit the most from getting first place. Crazy Cutters. Use your jackhammer to cut around the fossilized figures. The cleanest Crazy Cutter wins. This minigame's from the first Mario Party, except now it's a battle minigame instead of a four-player minigame. The possible shapes players have to cut are Cheap Cheeps, Chain Chomps, and Bloopers. The player who cuts the fossilized character with the most accuracy, depicted by their point value, wins. If you're moving and decide to take your hand off the analog stick, then your character will keep moving in the last direction you move them in. So you can't stop in the middle of cutting, you have have to keep going with what you got. Forgetting a detail like this may cause you to go so far off the outline that no matter how beautiful the rest of it looks, you'll get zero points, so don't screw around near the end. This minigame is pretty strict. Pay close attention to the tip of your drill and the outline you're leaving behind. It'll give you great insight as to how well you're doing and if any adjustments need to be made mid-match. Drilling upwards is a bit more difficult than drilling down since your character covers up the outline. This is why you want to drill down on the more complex side of the character and leave the simpler side for when you drill up. Be extra gentle with your analog stick whenever you're taking a turn. These are the parts that people lose the most points on, so mastering them will put you a step ahead. Day at the races. The race is about to begin. Pick the character you think will reach the finish line first. The order players pick their character is in direct correlation with their placing in the game. Fourth place picks first, third place picks second, second place picks third, and first place is stuck with whatever's left. Now, are you ready for me to blow your mind? This person made a post to Pastebin about this minigame. They made a lot of comments about how some of the RNG works, which was interesting, but where I found my attention pulled was the work they did a little lower on the page. Each racer has three starting animations you can see prior to choosing them. They then listed each type of racer along with the animation that identifies them. With this information, they ran tons of tests to see how every type of racer performed and listed them according to how often they came in second or first place. Looking at the data, it's clear that you should 
always pick the fast version of a racer if you see it available, unless it's a thwomp, whose fast version statistically loses more often than the slow versions of every other racer. The thwomp is so bad in fact that it got 4th place 43.6% of the time. That's awful! If you want the best chance at winning, then make sure you can identify each type of racer and make your selection from there. Facelift. Fix that nose, raise those cheeks, tug and pull your face to match the example. The closest person wins. This minigame's from the first Mario Party, except now it's a battle minigame instead of a four player minigame. There are three facial variants based on each of the playable characters, totaling up to 18 facial variants. The game will choose one of these facial variants for players to mirror. The features players can manipulate depend on which character's face it is. For Mario, it's his nose, left ear, right ear, left part of his mustache, right part of his mustache, and mouth. For Luigi, it's his nose, left ear, right ear, hat, and mouth. For Peach, it's her hair in the front, hair in the back left, hair in the back right, hair on the bottom left, and hair on the bottom right. For Yoshi, it's his nose, left cheek, right cheek, and mouth. For Wario, it's his nose, left ear, right ear, left part of his mustache, right part of his mustache, and mouth. For DK, it's his left ear, right ear, left part of his nose, right part of his nose, and mouth. The facial variations in this title are much less forgiving than the last one. Pulling the maximum distance for every feature will only get you so far. When the minigame is about to start, focus on the face that's being changed and try to memorize how each feature gets manipulated so you can better copy it afterwards. The easiest way to copy the face in the middle is to compare the slopes of its features. For example, I'm trying to copy this ear, so I'll try to match the slope of it as best I can. Doing this along with making overall comparisons should put you ahead of your opponents. When you're done, feel free to move your cursor to the middle of the screen to prevent your opponents from seeing the face. This is really mean though, and I just, I can't guarantee your friends are gonna remain your friends afterwards. Grab bag. It's a mushroom grab bag. Grab opponent's bags and pull mushrooms out by pressing the B button repeatedly. Someone's bag has a gold mushroom in it that's worth three normal ones. What's weird is that you don't see a gold mushroom enter anyone's bag right before the minigame starts. It appears that everyone receives five regular mushrooms. That's the trick though. In reality, one of the four players did receive a gold mushroom. The game's just hiding who got it. This means that a player is already winning by the time the minigame starts and they don't even even know it. Always assume you didn't get the gold mushroom and try to take as many other mushrooms as possible. If you see someone get a hold of the gold mushroom, then target that player. Even if they got a couple mushrooms after the gold one, there's a good chance it'll be within your grasp immediately. If you get your hands in the gold mushroom and you know you have some other mushrooms in stock, then jump away from the other players so they don't steal your lead. Punching's a great option to get people off of you too. If a player manages to grab you, then mash as fast as you possibly can to escape. If you get jumped on, then you can still steal from other players despite being a little slower. You can tell how many mushrooms a player has in their possession by the size of their bag. If it's huge, then they have a lot of mushrooms. If it's shriveled up, then they have none. The size of the bag does not indicate if a player has the gold mushroom. Hop a bomb. Don't let the bomb blow up in your hands or you're out. The last one standing is the winner. This minigame's from the first Mario Party, except now it's a battle minigame instead of a four player minigame. This title's version has just as much RNG as the last, except now the bomb doesn't consistently foreshadow when it's going to explode. Sometimes it'll flash bright red, which is definitely an indicator you should follow, and sometimes it'll only turn a little red, making you think everything's alright until BOOM, you're out. The average time it takes for it to explode is around 12 seconds or so. Not catching the bomb when it's thrown to you will not make it explode any quicker. If it's going to explode 2 seconds from when you catch it, then it'll still explode 2 seconds from when you don't catch it. The only downside to missing the catch is getting stunned for a short time. Remember that this is a battle mini game, so there's more at stake. Keep throwing the bomb to the player that's the biggest threat to your game. Even better if you can convince the other players to throw the bomb to that player too. Raking them in. Many mushrooms sit atop the spinning stump. Use your crane to rake in as many as you can. A regular mushroom has one point, a gold mushroom has three points, and a purple mushroom takes away three points. Each player has a timing zone, which differs depending on their position. 
If you press the A button when your target's in your timing zone, then you're bound to get it. Make sure you're focusing on gold mushrooms and avoiding purple mushrooms. Duel mini games. Saber Swipes played on Pirate Land. This is a fencing duel. Press the A, B, and Z buttons in the order shown on the screen. The first player to press them in order is the victor. If you mistake the order, you must start over. Swipe surely, but swiftly. Focus your eyes on where the prompt will show up. The moment you see the order of buttons, don't hesitate and press them as quickly as possible no matter what. If both players finish their button combination at the same time, the game will end with a draw and the match will restart. Quick Draw Corks played on Western Land. This is a pop gun duel. Goomba will count down. Press the A button as soon as Goomba says go. The fastest draw will be declared the winner. This mini game goes fast. Goomba will more often than not say go before even a single second's passed. If you draw before Goomba says go, then you'll be given a warning. If you draw before Goomba says go after that, then you lose the minigame. This warning should absolutely be taken advantage of. Try taking your shot a split second after the number one disappears. If you get lucky, then the Goomba will have said go a tiny bit before or right as you made your input. If you get unlucky and he didn't say go, then you'll be left off with a warning. At which point, play nice and react when the time comes. If you and your opponent somehow draw on the exact same frame, then the winner's determined by poor priority. Time Bomb played on Spaceland. This is a time bomb duel. Wait just as long as Goomba tells you, then press the A button. No timer is displayed, so you'll have to guess. Whoever is furthest from the actual time, regardless of whether they went over or under, must watch his or her bomb explode. Start counting down the moment all text leaves the screen. You won't be able to react instantly though, so you should account for the delay by pressing the A button a tiny bit before you get to zero. If both times are the same distance to what Goomba says, or if no one acts within 30 seconds, no bomb explodes, and a draw is declared. Psychic Safari played on Mystery Land. Press the A button and B button alternately to psychically power up the ancient relic. Whoever powers up his or her relic the most in 5 seconds wins. It's not about how fast you press a single button repeatedly, it's about how fast you can alternate between two button presses repeatedly. Remember that and power the relic up as much as possible. Mushroom Brew played on Horror Land. Let's do the best mushroom brew by putting the proper ingredients into the pot. There are three types of mushrooms. Add them in the order Goomba tells you to, and don't delay. Press the A button for blue, the B button for green, and the Z button for gray mushrooms. You don't need to memorize which button goes with each color since the prompt is kind enough to show you each time. The player with the most mushrooms in their pot will win the duel. It doesn't matter if you're a little late on reacting as long as you actually made the input while the prompt was up. If both players have the same number of mushrooms in their pot when the time runs out, a draw is declared, thus forcing the game to restart. Rock Paper Mario played on Bowser Land. Mario beats Bowser, Peach beats Mario, Bowser beats Peach. Just like rock, paper, scissors, the strongest one wins. The A button is Mario, the B button Peach, and the Z button Bowser. If you're sitting close enough to your opponent, then listen to the sound their controller makes upon their selection. After all, different buttons make different sounds. For example, the Z button on the N64 controller has a distinct sound when compared to the A and B buttons. So if you hear the Z button press, then that means they selected Bowser, so you should respond with Mario by pressing A. Hearing your opponent's input is unlikely though since Mario Party is rarely a quiet game. You may be able to predict what your opponent will throw out if you can guess their thought process. Are they the kind of person that will choose Peach because they like her so much? Are they a bit of a jokester and would think picking Mario while they're playing Mario would be funny? There's a lot of ways you could think about it, but at the end of the day, you don't have much control. If both players choose the same character, they'll tie forcing the game to restart. Item minigames, roll out the barrels, played on Pirate Land. They're rolling out the barrels. Keep your eyes on the barrel containing the item you won. If you pick the one with Baby Bowser inside, you miss. You'll also miss if you don't make a choice before the time runs out. When the barrels are laying down, they will only switch with barrels in their row. When they're upright, they can switch between rows. Once the barrels stop, please make your selection via ground pounding. It's a lot cooler than simply punching the thing. Give me a break, played on Western Land. Pull the brake to stop the circling locomotive and get the item that stops in front of you. There's two ways to time your pull to get the item you want. The first is to count two spaces ahead of your desired item, counterclockwise, and pull the lever when that item's in front of you. The second is to pull the lever when your desired item is touching the cactus on the top left corner. Choose whichever method you're most comfortable with. 
Hammer Slammer, played on Spaceland. Use the might of the hammer to launch the shuttle to the item you want. Here's the angle hammer needs to be around for Baby Bowser. The first item, the second item, the third item, the fourth item, and the fifth item. You start entering some weird territory if you go beyond the fifth item. Most of the time you'll end up getting bounced back to Baby Bowser and leave with nothing, but there's a chance you'll instead get bounced back to the first item or even the second item. These occurrences are rare though and shouldn't be relied upon. Simply drop your hammer once it's at the angle for the item you want. Mallet go round, play it on mystery land. Blocks spin around and sound. Use the hammer to hit two blocks and knock an item down. Each time you hit a block, the remaining ones spin faster and faster. What this explanation fails to mention is that the remaining blocks will spin the opposite direction with each hit. The moment you press A, you'll hit the block in front of you. If you hit the block of the item you want, then keep track of it to hit it again. If you keep hitting the wrong blocks, then settle for a different item. This minigame's tight on time and you don't want to leave with nothing. That may happen anyways if you end up hitting Baby Bowser's block, which there's only one of compared to the two blocks under each item, so be careful about him. Coffin Congestion, a played on Horror Land. The coffins open and close, revealing the items inside. Open one, if you dare. Pay close attention to where the item you crave has moved. Don't open Baby Bowser's coffin. If you do, then you leave with nothing. The same thing will happen if you don't make a choice before the time runs out. Stare at the middle of the screen and keep track of where your desired item goes with each shuffle. The only shuffle that actually matters is the last one, which will always be the fifth shuffle done. If you have trouble distinguishing between items like the skeleton key and golden mushroom, then target items that look more unique. Bowser Slot, played on Bowser Land. It takes well-timed jumps to line up three of a kind, match them up to win. All roulettes will remain at the same speed throughout the entire mini game. One of the items will show up two times in a row on each wheel. If you make this item your target, then you'll find that it's incredibly easy to obtain. Just memorize one item that spins before it, and then jump with proper timing. Rinse and repeat for the other two roulettes, and you're good. If you really don't want the item that's showing up two times in a row, then focus on memorizing two items before the one you want, and then jump with proper timing. Rinse and repeat for the other two roulettes, and you're good. I only recommend doing this if the item that's showing up twice really wouldn't be of much help to you. If you don't hit the block after 30 seconds, then the roulette will stop for you. You'll leave the minigame with nothing if you don't match three items in a row. But so long as you keep my tips in mind, you got this. Mario Party 2 really is something special. It introduced items, battle minigames, and duel minigames to the series. It influenced Mario Party 6's main gimmick with Horror Land's day and night system. It also influenced Mario Party 7's main gimmick with Bowser Land's every five turns event. All of that while being one of the most charming titles in the whole series, from the outfits that the characters wear to the silly stories that players unfold as they travel through each of the wondrous boards. While I do wish players could hold more than one item, that's not nearly enough to detract from my experience. This title was a solid next step in the series, and I'm glad that's been able to retain its magic to this day. Thanks for watching. See you next time when we cover Mario Party 3.